And if we could have the panel come forward if, if we're here. The first uh, that I want to introduce is Rick Shero. He is an Army trained arson investigator. After 20 years in Army ordnance, he served as a senior explosives officer with the BATF. He left that post in 1992 and has been a private arson and explosives investigator since that time. I'm not sure. I think all the names are now up here. If Mr. Sherrill could make his way, I see his name tag over here on the far uh, left. Next, we have with us on this final panel of today, Paul Gray, who is an arson investigator at the Houston Fire Department and was the, the leader of the Justice Department Special Fire Team Review Team, whose findings are included in the Justice Department report. I believe Ms. Uh, Sheila Jackson uh, Lee would like to welcome uh, Mr. Gray as a Houstonite. Would you like to do so? I certainly would, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, offer to uh, Mr. Gray, Assistant Chief Gray, and uh, leadership that he brings to the Houston Fire Department. And I might take a moment of personal privilege just to say the best department uh, in the world. But in any event, to welcome here to Washington and to acknowledge the Houston Fire Department for its hard work, uh, both in terms of the effort uh, made uh, in the tragedy of Waco, but as well uh, in the efforts made on behalf of the citizens of Oklahoma City. So I welcome you. Uh, to Washington, D.C., and certainly uh, give my respects to the Houston Fire Department. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, you're quite welcome. The next uh, witness we have is James, James Quinteri. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Who uh, also served on the fire review team for justice. He is a professor of fire protection engineering at the University of Maryland. He has served as chief for fire research at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He is the current chairman of the International Association for Fire Safety Science. And uh, then our final witness is Mr. Clive Doyle. He is a Branch uh, Davidian who survived the fire inside the compound and will be our other and, and last witness on this panel today. If you would, I noticed you're all standing. If you raise your right hand, and, and uh, I ask you, would, uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all four of these uh, panelists have uh, answered that question in the affirmative. I then uh, yield uh, for the first round of questioning to Mr. Klinger, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I would like to ask Mr. Doyle, who is the, uh, only the second, I think, Branch Davidian who has uh, appeared before the, before the committees uh, and is a survivor and was there on the event, if he would uh, be able to uh, give us a narrative from your perspective of, of the events that took place. Mr. Doyle. If I may, I'd like to read a statement that I prepared, uh, which gives somewhat of a narrative. Mr. Doyle, you may do that, but we are under this five-minute rule, so we'll the best you can uh, to, uh, to... You don't have to limit it precisely to it, but we'll have a vote here in a minute. So please proceed. I'd just like to thank the members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to speak at these hearings. If truth and justice are really the important concerns here, then it puzzles me that only two of the survivors have been given an opportunity uh, to speak at these hearings. That is David Thibodeau and myself. Several survivors I know were in the Washington area last week uh, and were not called. And also I know that those nine survivors that are in prison would definitely have liked to have added their uh, experience to these hearings. <clears throat> so it is my privilege and I feel my duty to address the subcommittee members uh, on behalf of those survivors that can't speak for themselves. And on behalf of the 82 that died throughout the 51 days, first thing I'd like to say is that there was no ambush of the ATF officers. They were not on February 28th inside the building knew anything about the arrival of the ATF until maybe a minute or so before the trailers drove in the gate. I personally was in my room at the north end of the building which if you've seen diagrams of the building would be the third window from the left-hand end. 
And I recall hearing some people in the chapel, uh, excuse me, in the cafeteria area, and it puzzled me that people would be in there since breakfast was over. I went out to see what was going on, and it was at that time that there was talk that word had come in that something was coming, that somebody was coming. About the time I arrived, David Koresh walked in from the opposite door uh, from the kitchen serving area and confirmed that he had heard somebody was coming and he cautioned us and says, I want everybody to stay cool, uh, go back to your rooms and just, you know, wait. He says, I will go to the door and talk to these individuals, whoever they are. I went back to my room and within a minute, I'd say, or less, uh, heard David at the front door saying, hey, wait a minute, there are women and children in here, let's talk about this. <clears throat> Immediately shots rang out, coming from the outside in, and I, although not an expert in firearms or, or ballistics or anything, you could definitely tell the difference between shots fired outside as opposed to shots fired indoors. It had a distinctly different sound. I went running down the hall thinking there must have been a massacre or people hurt at least in the area of the front door and found Perry Jones laying in the hall screaming that he'd been shot. Perry Jones was in his 60s. He was unarmed, as was David Koresh. When they went to the front door, both were shot in the area of the front door. Uh, David was shot in the wrist. Perry Jones was shot in the stomach. I know that this is different than what the autopsies allegedly reveal. I have some contentions with the autopsy findings and the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's uh, Office. I don't, you might say, trust their findings in as much as during the trial that we had in San Antonio uh, Dr. Piawani made repeated mistakes in uh, the identification of various people and various information about these people. Uh, we could get into the details later. Upon finding Perry screaming that he'd been shot and holding his stomach where there appeared to be blood coming through his clothes, I told him to hang on there for a minute and I rushed to the front door thinking there may be others uh, also wounded. To my surprise, there was no one else in the foyer area, and I re retraced my steps back and helped Perry uh, with the help of another individual by the name of Livingston Malcolm. We helped him to a bed uh, on the inside of the, of the building. Well, in all fairness to you, and I think that Ms. Thurman would agree to this, that uh, we didn't anticipate when we started your testimony, when Mr. Klinger asked that, that we okay. would be interrupted by this vote. And it, it occurred almost simultaneously. Okay. Uh, although the five minutes that he has has expired, we always give the witnesses the opportunity to complete the answer. And you are going to have an opportunity to put your whole statement in. Let us hear your description of what happened that day. But I think we should come back from the vote and let all of us have the opportunity to hear it uninterrupted by all these noises and all the hassle that's going on and uh, you may take whatever time you need to do that when we come back. Thank you. So with that in mind, the hearings will be in recess until after this vote. We'll try to return within five minutes of the vote's conclusion. The hearings are in recess. You're watching day eight of last month's House Waco hearings. We'll be back with more testimony in five minutes. First, we talk with David Jackson of the Dallas Morning News about his paper's coverage of the hearings. David Jackson of the Dallas Morning News. Looking back on the, the Waco hearings, what's your assessment of what came out of all those hearings? Well, a lot of documentation about what really happened. Uh, there was some feeling that the entire incident from A to Z hadn't really been thoroughly examined certainly not in a congressional forum. So anything you ever wanted to know about what happened or didn't happen in Waco, we could probably find an answer to it now, although some would argue that those questions have been answered in at least one form or another before the hearings. But now there's, there's not much doubt that we've uh, totally exhausted the, uh, the debate, so to speak. 
Was there a moment in the hearings that was particularly riveting for you as a journalist? Well, for several for us in Texas, one was the uh, testimony of former Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson, former senator from our state who was uh, heavily criticized by members of the panel for uh, what they felt was a lack of activity on his part for not getting as involved as he should have uh, in the raid. Uh, Secretary Benson, of course, said that uh, you know, he was delegating responsibility to the ATF and, uh, and, uh, and to others. So that was a particularly interesting part of the hearings for us. And also uh, Janet Reno's testimony on the final day, which kind of wrapped up uh, everything that had happened in the nine days previous. And uh, it was a final opportunity for people to, to really say what was on their mind about the Waco incident. And uh, the, the exchanges between uh, Ms. Reno and members of the committee, particularly the Republican members, was uh, parts of it were quite interesting. Expand on that a little bit about what you thought was particularly interesting. Well, just the, um, just at, at several points, uh, several Republicans criticized Ms. Reno for the gas attack, and uh, Ms. Reno responded that it was, it, once again, that she took responsibility for it. At one point, she talked about she was particularly hurt by the suggestions that she was responsible for the deaths of the children inside the compound. I mean, this is pretty dramatic stuff. Uh, you know, it was a horrible incident. I think anybody who saw it live on television will never forget it. I know I never will. And just to, to bring back, uh, to have such a prolonged discussion of that final day of that fire and those children dying inside the compound, it was, it was quite emotional. Mm -hmm. You mentioned members of the committee. Which uh, members in particular uh, stood out, do you think, during the hearings? Well, of course, the two chairmen, um, uh, Bill McCollum and uh, Bill Zeliff, uh, were... Uh, particularly memorable. But they, they each had their individual style. I would say uh, Congressman Zell was a little more aggressive than Congressman McCollum uh, in, uh, in questioning some aspects of the entire incident, but uh, both were pretty critical. And uh, on the other side would be uh, Congressman Schumer from New York, who pretty much carried the ball in defending the administration. I think those were really the three key figures. What was the atmosphere in the room like uh, that perhaps you can tell in person that doesn't really come across on television? Um, it would usually start off tense, right, when uh, witnesses would start testifying. Um, but, of course, all the sessions were quite long. I mean, some of them went to 9 or 10 o'clock, so you, get, uh, you can get qu pretty exhausted sitting there and watching some of these hearings. Uh, in fact, Lee Hancock, my colleague, and I, we kind of switched off to try, to try to beat back some of the exhaustion. But it, it's, uh, it's, it's intense, I guess is the right word, because you just never know what, uh, who's going to attack when and uh, how the person may respond. Other than the, uh, the big political names that testified, there were a number of folks testifying who are experts in a variety of areas. Uh, what was, how would you characterize that part of the testimony? Uh, it would provide a good background, uh, particularly about the history of the Branch Davidian religious cult, um, uh, the use of tear gas and the types of tear gas that can be used and things like that. Uh, frankly, I didn't find that testimony as riveting as the people who were actually there on the, on the scene, the people who were in Waco. I think those, that was the really the most interesting testimony. But some of the expert testimony did help to fill in uh, some gaps, help educate some people about some of the things that were involved and some of the background and some of the decisions that were made. You mentioned trading off with your colleague. How easy or difficult was this a story to cover? It was pretty difficult because it was uh, so, so thorough, so many questions, and the witness panels, some of them were up to like eight or eight people, as I recall. The largest one was eight people, and so it's a lot of different angles to cover, and you have to try to put it into a coherent fashion on deadline. Um, also, our early edition is uh, we like to try to get stories in by 7 o'clock Eastern time so that we can get them in the early edition, which goes all over Texas, so that put a little time crunch on us as well. But um, it's just very difficult because there's just so much information. You have to try to boil it down to an understandable form and also make it relevant to the reader. So it, uh, it was difficult, but fortunately, Lee Hancock, I think, spent all 51 days in Waco when this happened, so um, we, we probably had a, a better shot at it than a lot of people. You mentioned the documentation uh, that came out. What, what new did you learn from the hearings that you didn't know before? Frankly, I'd have to say nothing, but uh, I was pretty familiar with the issue having uh, been in Dallas at the time it happened and having read both the Treasury and the Justice Department reports, having read several books about the incident. And this is something that was a big debate during the hearings, and it's still a big debate, is how much new came out of it. Well, if you were intensely familiar with what happened and had read all of these things, 
you know, nothing new happened, but how many people have had the time or the interest to want to go through all this documentation? So for someone, for the average Joe sitting at home, they probably learned quite a bit about, about what happened and what some of the mistakes that were made and probably uh, found out some things they didn't know before. Hearings are done in the House. What's the next step? Well, there's talk. The Senate is talking about having Waco hearings of its own, but I think there's quite a bit of debate because um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of Republicans were not pleased with what happened during the House Waco hearings. They, they felt like they either didn't make their case well enough or they came off a little too zealous. And this debate is carrying over into the Senate, so I think there's some questions as to whether to have continued hearings on the Waco incident or have more general hearings about federal law enforcement. Um, as you probably know, Senator Specter is planning to have hearings on the Ruby Ridge incident, and they may try to tie in with that and, and look at federal law enforcement in general as opposed to the specific incident at Waco. David Jackson of the Dallas Morning News. Thanks very much. Thank you. Tomorrow, day nine of the Waco hearings. The witnesses include a panel of FBI special agents. And on Friday, we'll air the final day of the House hearings with testimony from Attorney General Janet Reno. Tonight on C-SPAN, War in the Pacific. This week, as we approach the 50th anniversary of VJ Day, we're airing a series of programs focusing on prisoners of war and the A-bomb. Tonight, see part three of the series at midnight Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Pacific. We now return to our coverage of the House Waco hearings, testifying our former Branch Davidian, Clive Doyle, and arson expert, James Quintere. Ruth Riddle. Please join hearings. We'll come back to order. When we were in recess a few minutes ago for a vote. We had... Mr. Klinger's time having expired in the process of Mr. Doyle giving his testimony and responding to the question to describe what happened inside the compound uh, and, and whatever else he wished to with regard to the whole situation for the Davidians that day. Mr. Doyle, as I told you before, you may proceed and uh, you're not being clocked because you are responding to a question of Mr. Klinger's, so please tell your story. Wait, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Schumer. <clears throat> Uh, I understand that Mr. Doyle will get as much time as he needs to do his opening statement, which I have no problem with. On Mr. Klinger's time, post that. Mr. Klinger took the time to ask him that question. He had five minutes, but there'll right. be more. That's right. And um, we have two people who would like to do the same. Mr. Quintieri has a presentation to make that may go beyond five minutes in terms of the film. And Mr. Gray had wanted to, uh, to I have speak. no problem with that, provided that they begin their presentation. With someone right, yielding so that, to them. So that we consume somebody's five minutes. And Great. Then, then we can go on. I Very think that's fair. an orderly, appropriate way Thank to do it. Thank you. Appreciate Mr. it. Mr. Doyle, you may continue until you are finished. You, you are recognized. <clears throat> Thanks, Sheila. As I was stating uh, prior to the break, I helped Perry Jones with the help of another individual. We helped him back into the men's dormitory area <clears throat> at the north end of the building and placed him in a bunk bed. Uh, we put him on an inside room rather than in his own room because there were bullets still coming through the walls. And uh, we were, I was afraid that if we put him in his own bed, he would receive other wounds, um, you know, as a result of these shots coming into the building. Uh, it turned out that the bed we put him in belonged to Kevin Whitecliffe. I went from placing Perry Jones in the bed. I, I commandeered three people that were basically in shock and, and kind of milling around. Uh, I told them to stay with Perry, take care of him. Okay. Conversation. If you could take them in the back room if they need be. Thank you. Okay. Please proceed. I asked these three individuals to take care of Perry, comfort him, do whatever they could for him, and I rushed across the hall to my room uh, in order to get him some 
uh, Tylenol. Uh, I had a couple of Tylenol tablets that had been given to me, and I brought them back and gave them to him to alleviate the pain. He was screaming. It was very unnerving uh, to hear his screams of pain. Uh, after giving him the Tylenol, somebody came up to me and said Winston Blake was dead. I said, where is he? They said, he's in his room. So I made my way further up the hall uh, to the north. He was the last room uh, on the inside. And as I approached his bedroom doorway, I could hear water running, and it kind of puzzled me. Couldn't make out, you know, what was creating that sound until I rounded the, the doorway and found Winston laying in a pool of blood and water on the floor. The reason for the water uh, pouring into the room was the fact that the outside of Winston's room, uh, his was the only room on the inside, uh, or sh I should say on the, uh, the back side of the hallway that ran the length of the building that had a window in it. The other three rooms uh, on that side of the hall uh, butted up to the cafeteria area and therefore they only had sheetrock walls. But his room had a window, but you couldn't see out of the window. There were three uh, huge plastic water tanks on a foundation outside the window, which totally blocked the window from either seeing in or out. And uh, the water was coming from dozens of bullet holes that had been uh, coming out of this uh, water tank on a downward angle. They were, in other words, on the outside of the tank, the bullet holes were high up and, and coming down into the room, which led me to believe uh, the helicopters had been firing, contrary to what uh, ATF and, and other officials uh, have stated. Other witnesses uh, have confirmed, such as Marjorie Thomas, who gave a video deposition for our trial in San Antonio, uh, Catherine Madison also uh, testified that bullets were fired uh, and, they, and for those that were upstairs and in toward the back of the building most of the survivors that I have talked to will testify that's the first shots that they heard was from the helicopters as opposed to those of us that were in the front and on the first floor we were hearing them at the front door so they were probably fairly simultaneous uh, so I, I believe that Winston Blake was, was shot from these helicopters, therefore I disagree with the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office, which is a point in my opening remarks that uh, Tarrant County testified that Winston Blake was shot by somebody inside, uh, that he was supposed to have gunpowder burns in the wound. But from what I've read, uh, New autopsies were done when his body was returned to England, and it was decided there that uh, there were no powder burns in the wound, and his wounds were con uh, went along with the concept of being shot from above. I understand Jim Kavanaugh indicated in some answers that he gave, or in some statements he gave the other day, that. Uh, he was the one that initiated calls into the Mount Carmel uh, building during the initial raid. I think just about everybody who's read anything knows that it was Wayne Martin, Harvard graduate lawyer, that uh, initiated the 911 calls to the Sheriff's Department uh, in Waco. And. Uh, Any delay, any suffering caused by agents that were shot uh, is, has to fall to some extent uh, on the fact that Larry Lynch, the sheriff's deputy who was answering the calls, monitoring the calls, was not able to reach the ATF and uh, arrange for any help or, or ambulances or whatever. Uh, we were calling for ceasefire right from the start. This is not conducive or uh, does not go along with the concept that we are all just waiting to massacre them. There was no murder 
of federal agents. I am in sympathy with the families of those that lost, uh, the families of the four agents that died. But I don't call it murder when people are de trying to defend themselves, uh, believing that you're being attacked by a, uh, a military force using helicopters and, and, and so on, uh, who come racing into your house or trying to race into your house using grenades and, and various uh, different kinds of weapons shooting into your building. If those agents were shot from inside, I would at least give us the benefit of the doubt that it was self-defense. The, <clears throat> the prosecutors during our trial tried to prove conspiracy and murder, and all 11 defendants were found by a jury to be not guilty of those two charges. And I think that, uh, to me, is f for the president and for any uh, media or, or anybody in this committee to continue to refer uh, to us as murderers, um, I feel that's unjust. If the killing of federal agents, which was never proven as to who shot them, if the killing of them constitutes murder, then those who shot and killed our people inside must also bear that label of murderers. As I say, I sympathize with the families. I know what they're going through. We lost a lot of friends and a lot of our families. I lost a daughter inside Mount Carmel. <laughs> There was a lot of fear after the ATF retreated, after we finally got the ceasefire set up, allowed them to come get the wounded and, and uh, those that were killed. There was a lot of fear that there would be retaliation. There were people who began grabbing guns after the fact. Um, the government tried to say that everybody, they could put a gun in everybody's hand at the beginning and during the raid, and that's not true. Most people were, were unarmed. There were a few that had guns, and I admit that, and there were probably those that reacted to seeing David and Perry and others gunned down who responded by firing back. But it was not a general ambush as they would like you to believe. As I said, after they had retreated, and I might just add that in the course of their retreat where, you, uh, where the agents were helping each other leave the property, that was the first time that I actually got to see agents and was totally shocked by the number of, of individuals involved because I had, in the course of the morning, uh, tried to you know, I would ask people, who's out there and where are they? And, and they'd say, well, they're hiding behind the vehicles and so on. But I couldn't see anybody. So it wasn't until they got up and began to leave that and my mouth dropped open, uh, totally surprised at how many there were. But as I said, after they'd left, we figured retaliation. We figured, you know, with agents wounded and dead, that they'd want to get even. There's a lot of fear inside on the part of the residents that they would come back perhaps at night and uh, try to get revenge on us. So some began to grab weapons and, or, or to pass out weapons to others that didn't have weapons and so on. Some that already had weapons were um, getting extra magazines or, or whatever with ammunition in and so forth. David Koresh <clears throat> had been wounded twice that morning, once at the front door and Having been wounded there, he slammed the door and ran upstairs where he was, ended up being shot again. During that first day, he was laying in a little hallway that went back to the central tower, feeling that he was about to die. He was bleeding profusely. Uh, he thought his hip was shattered. And, uh, but word got to him that people were grabbing weapons. Weapons were being brought out of where they'd been stored. And uh, even though I didn't hear it personally, the word came down to, to us who were in the chapel area uh, that we were to put our faith in God. We were not to 
feel that the guns were going to be our protection. And anybody that didn't have a weapon uh, prior uh, to the raid itself, or people who had weapons and were getting extra weapons or extra ammunition, would have put them all back where they came from. And uh, not everybody apparently knew where they went, so a lot of them were just dropping them where they you know, happened to be when the message came around. And so I picked up several uh, weapons and took them back. I asked where they were supposed to be kept and was told that they were kept in the concrete uh, vault area, which was basically the, behind the, the cooking area of the kitchen, which the base of the central tower. And that was the first time I even knew there were weapons stored in there. Like the ATF, I thought that whatever weapons were out there were stored in the upstairs room that the ATF were breaking into, but I found out that that was stale information. They had, hadn't been there for several months. So uh, in taking the guns back and putting them back in the room was the first time I was aware of where they'd been moved to. What a lot of people don't understand is that there were areas of Mount Carmel that were off limits to most of the people. People didn't just go up to the rooms that were David Koresh's that were over the chapel or, or near the uh, gymnasium. Probably one or two people had access to the machine shop. No one else was permitted in there. Uh, other areas were off limits for various reasons. So uh, the fact that, you know, everybody knew things is, is an assumption. For the next 50 days, and, and I might add before that, that during the course of the, in the morning, um, word had come to us by, you know, the word was getting around at how many were wounded and who, had, who was wounded and so on. We learned that Peter Jand had been shot up on top of the water tower. Peter had been working in there, um, built, um, well, he'd built some scaffolding in there and some platforms so that he could scrub the rust off of our, our big metal water tower. Uh, he was shot uh, when he put his head out the top of the, of the water tower. That's all I know about that. Um, Peter Hipsman was also shot in there. Scott Sanobi. J. Dean Wendell was shot laying in her bed on the second floor. She was a mother of four. Unbeknownst to us for several weeks, uh, David Jones had been shot. I guess he was embarrassed about his shot because it was in his buttocks or buttocks, okay? And it wasn't until the nurses came into the chapel one day and said, well, they just removed a bullet from David Jones uh, that we even knew he'd been shot. His, his children didn't even know it, that were in there with him. Steve Schneider's wife had been shot the bullet had split her finger open, it had skipped up her arm and lodged in her shoulder. There was a lot of people that were very upset to see this carnage, to see people killed, your friends killed and wounded. And uh, I'm not going to justify everything that's perhaps been done but I do think that they had a right to self-defense and try to defend the women and children under the circumstances. I think anybody would have done the same if they'd have been in our position, not knowing what all was going on and, and what it was all about, but just being caught in the, in the crossfire and so forth. For the next 50 days, we basically went through varying degrees of hell I remember the night that uh, I was sitting in the chapel where it already, I think, began to get dark, and I don't remember the date, but it was when they first brought the tanks. Uh, the FBI brought the tanks into play in, in, in the siege. And we were sitting in the chapel, and you couldn't see out of the windows of the chapel. They were like opaque, um, kind of that rippled glass that they put in bathroom windows and so on. But all of a sudden, the whole building began to shake like an earthquake. And so we went over to the south wall of the chapel and cracked a window in order to look out 
and uh, half a mile away on the farm road that leads from Elk down to Balmead area was this big convoy of trailers with the tanks mounted on the, on the top of these trailers. And the ground for a half a mile was shaking and the building was shaking. And yet we were hearing um, on the radio that we had a fortified compound and we kind of said to ourselves if only they could be in here and realize how flimsy this place is. One of the girls, Lisa Farris by name, <clears throat> went into the foyer about the time we saw the tanks being brought and uh, picked out a world book encyclopedia and began to read up uh, what they had written in there about the various, the Bradleys and the various tank, tanks that were, uh, we were being told were being brought down. Uh, I can remember in the chapel area where I was, there was a lot of fear. People were making remarks like, well, if, if they've got this kind of firepower, if they open up on us, uh, this place is going to look like Swiss cheese. People were very concerned that they'd either be shot by the tanks or if the tanks made incursions into the building that we would be crushed by falling timbers and so on. We were trying to cooperate. I believe David was sincere in his cooperation with the AT, uh, excuse me, with the FBI negotiators. Uh, he had originally been talking with the ATF, and I, I believe he felt he had a very good rapport with uh, Jim Cavanaugh or whoever uh, he'd talked to on the 28th. Uh, so much so that I believe after the FBI took over the operation, uh, David demanded that Jim still be allowed to talk to him on the phone because he, he felt this uh, closeness to them. At no time was there any hatred toward the ATF or toward the FBI agents that were there uh, for the things that were going on. David had a very uh, deep concern for people's souls. Um, as far as the negotiations were concerned, I believe they were trying to wear him out. Uh, trying to, of course, in, in their doing their job, trying to get as many out alive as possible, and, and that's commendable. But this whole situation should never have happened in the first place. It could have been handled so many different ways uh, at, and at different times to where no agents would have died and no residents of Mount Carmel would have died. But having gone through the initial raid and, and people being killed, we were trying to make the best of it, and children were being sent out. We were cooperating. It was my understanding that we were being told that we couldn't all just come out at any place at any time en masse. Uh, that it was to be orderly. It had to be arranged over the negotiating phones. And so uh, people like myself, who was occupied with various jobs of uh, taking care of garbage, taking care of uh, human waste and so on throughout the 50 days felt that in all likelihood the women, the children, the elderly would be the first ones out and those of us who were able-bodied and able to perhaps take care of necessary chores would probably be the last. But we were sincerely expecting to come out. Everybody I know in there had their bags packed. But as the 50 days wore on and as the um, the tactical team in the tanks began to uh, do things uh, on a more and more, you know, more and more pressure was in, uh, expended by them, uh, which seemed to work at cross purposes with what the negotiators were promising and so on. Uh, people began to balk. We observed, um, you know, immoral, what we considered immoral acts. Uh, FBI agents were mooning people from the tanks. A number of individuals uh, have testified to that and told me that. Um, we had all, we had the electricity turned off, of course, and uh, most of our fresh or frozen foods were destroyed or spoiled. So as I say, we went through varying degrees of hell with noise, music, bright lights, the children, were suffering along with the adults. We were without water, having had our water tanks shot up, 
we were living on rainwater. Whenever it would rain, people would put buckets out the window and collect rainwater, and it was rationed. I doubt whether anybody got more than eight ounces a day, if that. I lost 25 pounds by April 19th. I know others that lost about the same amount. You say, why didn't the people come out? There's two reasons. One is fear. One is distrust. Uh, I take it back. There's more than one reason. One is fear of what's going to happen to you if you come out. One is distrust because you're being told certain things that aren't taking place. Uh, the negotiators had promised that if certain people come out, they could keep their Bibles when they were taken to jail. Uh, I'd been told that I could, if I came out, I could go and live with my daughter in California, but everybody that came out we saw was being handcuffed and carted off to jail. We were hearing their Bibles were being taken away from them. Their, their bags and whatever they brought out with them were being confiscated and held as evidence and things like this. And so even though we all had our bags packed, uh, as time went on, uh, people began to maybe not even take them with them when they exited. One of those was Kevin Whitecliffe, who was in the chapel with me. He had a bag packed, and uh, when, it, when he came out, he just gave all these clothes away. He says, I'm not going to get to keep these, so if you want them, you know, go ahead and use them. And as a result of the lack of water, uh, we were starting to wear anything we could find. You know, we even got into the, the supplies that David and the guys that went to gun shows they had bought up large supplies of, of camouflage clothing. We, we got into that because our clothes were dirty and we couldn't wash them. We didn't have any water. We didn't wear them as a statement. We didn't wear them to, to hide in amongst the bushes or anything like that. It was simply a matter of necessity in order to have some uh, element of cleanliness. There were people that came out of the building, especially in the last week or two before April 19th that had grenades thrown at them or fired at them. Steve Schneider was one of them and he was the one that was or one of the ones that was doing the negotiations with the FBI. He was going out at various times and picking up batteries or, or, or milk or, or whatever that the tanks would bring in, uh, a lot of which was bugged as you've probably learned in these hearings. Uh, we found a lot of them. We probably, there was others that we didn't find. But uh, even Steve Schneider, in coming out uh, to pick up something one day, had two of these flashbang grenades uh, lobbed at him, scared the daylights out of him. So on the 19th of April, I was in the chapel. It was still dark, and I was using the lights from the floodlights that they had on us all night, uh, these sleep deprivation methods that they were using somewhat backfired in a sense because I was using the light to try to transcribe one of David's studies that was on tape. I was listening to it and trying to write it out in longhand using this outside light. I remember about six o'clock or give or take a few minutes, uh, we were told over the loudspeakers that tanks would be inserting holes into the building. Uh, or poking holes into the building to insert gas. Um, since I happened to be awake and, and others that were awake, um, immediately we began to wake up everybody else and, and, and let them know that, you know, to expect uh, this attack, this uh, gas being sent in. Some of us had gas masks. The children didn't. Most of the women didn't. Uh, I believe it's been testified to this committee that uh, water tends to aggravate that gas, and I can testify to that. I can't tell you exactly how the children dealt with it, but if water aggravates it, then trying to wrap wet towels and wet blankets around you to survive probably only made their suffering worse, since they were in a cul-de-sac type room with no ventilation no windows, and only one door, which at least once was the gas was fired in at point-blank range uh, into that area. Questions have come up like, well, why didn't you put 
the children in the bus where there was relatively clean air. But during our trial, it was testified that the storm shelter, the underground storm shelter as they call it, or the bunker, was one of the first things they gassed. The northwest corner of the building had been pushed in by the CEV, and when the driver was asked why he did that, he says because they'd heard there was a trap door in there. And it was his job to push building material and, and so forth uh, over the trap door so nobody could escape. So it, to me, it's, it's um, a dishonest statement to say, well, why didn't you put the children in the bus? As I say, there was a lot of concern as to what would happen to people that came out, whether they would be shot. Uh, those of us in the chapel were dodging uh, the ferret rounds. They were like rockets coming through the windows and through the walls. Uh, when I'd first heard they were going to inject gas, other than from the nozzle of the CEV, in my uh, uneducated um, understanding, I'm thinking of Hollywood where a grenade is thrown into a room and somebody runs over, picks it up, and throws it back out the window if you don't want it. I mentioned that to somebody and they said, well, you can't pick them up, they're hot. And I said, well, maybe we could use a glove. You never got to see them. They whiz past your head so fast that, uh, as I say, it was like a rocket. The only time you could see them at all was when they hit a wall stuck into the sheetrock and were hissing and, and so on. Anybody that was hit by them could have been severely hurt. I heard Jimmy Riddle had been hit in the face but happened to have his gas mask on and was only knocked down. He wasn't seriously hurt by one of them anyway. But other than that, I don't know what was going on at the other end of the building because after six hours of gassing and six hours of tanks penetrating the walls, pushing on the walls, destroying the gymnasium at the back, uh, those of us in the chapel were virtually cut off from the rest of the building. The roof of the gymnasium had collapsed and blocked the back stairs that went up to David Koresh's rooms. Um, <clears throat> the tank had come through the front door area on numerous occasions. The last one right into the chapel area was spraying gas there. They'd continue to push on the front of the building to where the whole first floor hall uh, that ran the length of the building was blocked with the dividing walls in the various bedrooms being pushed back into the hallway and the sheetrock and the tubifors uh, cutting off any opportunity for us to, to have contact with the people at the other end in the cafeteria or whatever. We were not able to get upstairs and uh, now whether the stairs out of the cafeteria was still usable? I don't know. I was not, a, as I said, I, we were cut off uh, to the point where we couldn't, didn't have contact with any of those people up there. At one point, probably uh, around noon, I'm not real good with uh, time, but I'd say around noon, somebody came into the chapel and told us the building was on fire. We instinctively rem I had the feeling, I don't remember them actually saying where it was, but my recollection was the feeling of everybody in the chapel was it's upstairs in the front somewhere. And so we moved away from the front of the building and got up on the stage and went round behind a petition that was built on the, the stage of the chapel. And on the south wall, a tank had knocked a hole in the, from the outside in. There was a big heap of sheetrock and, and lumber and so forth that the tank had pushed in and uh, the first ones to get to that hole were David Thibodeau and myself and we hesitated for a moment in coming out the conversation as I remember it was well if we come out will we be shot we knew there were sniper nests uh, uh, sniper positions uh, on the south side there was one that was sandbagged over near the fence we knew that there were agents inside our boat shed. We knew there was a tank park next to the boat shed under the tree. There were individuals outside of the tanks. And I might add that all through the, the 51 days siege, uh, 
if all we were were a bunch of crazies that wanted to kill agents, we had endless opportunities to fire on them if we so chose, and we didn't. Mr. Chairman, pardon me, Mr. Doyle. Uh, point of uh, inquiry, Mr. Chairman, do we have a time frame? Now, I don't mean to be cutting Mr. Doyle. No, he's, uh, he's being permitted to finish his statement. He was okay. on Mr. Klinger's time. But because I, I came in late and didn't know about it. I, I, I apologize to you, Mr. Doyle, for interrupting you. So there was this moment of hesitation on the part of David uh, Thibodeau and myself as to what would happen if we came out uh, out of the hole. Would we be fired at? There was some concern about it. We were surrounded by tanks. There were Bradleys. There were the CEVs. And they had been, as I say, lobbing these um, ferret rounds or firing these ferret rounds most of the morning. And they sounded kind of like mortars or whatever. Uh, you couldn't tell whether they were firing at us other than those or not. If they'd have used silences, we wouldn't have known. So uh, in that just moment or so of hesitation, other people were crowding in behind us to the point where uh, eventually 10 people were crowded in a little narrow space behind this petition. But I recall in looking out the hole and deciding whether we would jump out was that all of a sudden smoke came along the outside of the building, along the south wall of the chapel, uh, heading from west to east toward the back of the building. And, and uh, when it got to the hole, it was like it just got sucked in uh, where we were. And the whole area that we were in just turned pitch black. And almost immediately, it was like you could feel heat over your head and on both sides. And I found myself down on the floor, rolling around, trying to protect myself from, from the heat. Uh, my hands were the only um, areas that were basically uncovered. I did have a gas mask on at the time, in spite of the fact that the filter had blocked up about 30 minutes after the gassing started. Uh, I'd been told that earlier in the morning, uh, that the filters wouldn't last long. And when it did block up, I'd taken my mask off only to find my face burning and stinging. It was like you had acid all over you. And so I put the mask back on. I, I felt I'd rather suck air through the block filter than continue with this burning sensation. I saw other adults that had less clothing on than myself uh, stinging and crying in pain because of the, the CS gas getting on their skin. And because they were uh, uneducated in the use of gas or, or what it was like. Some of them were trying to wipe it off with minimal amounts of their drinking water on them, perhaps a, ha a rag or, or whatever, only to find that it, it made it worse. So as I say, what the children were going through, only God knows. There came a point in my rolling on the floor and, and trying to protect myself from the heat and, and being in the pitch black, not able to see that the voices of those behind me screaming kind of got through to me. I recognized who they were. could identify the voices. It kind of galvanized me to just leap to my feet and jump or, or dive head first in the general direction of where I figured the hole was. I landed on the sheetrock face down and kind of slithered out onto the ground. When I stood up, the skin was rolling off my hands. My coat was all melted on my back and smoking. Now, I looked back over my shoulder and the hole had just come out with a mass of flames. And the first thought that came to me was, I'm the only one. I'm the only one to get out. I was in shock and pain and I staggered away from the building and I ran into the razor wire fence. I'd kind of forgotten that they'd surrounded us with this razor wire and I, I ran slap bang into it and I tried to look, you know, what do I do now? Where do I go? And I looked to my left and I looked to my right, and as I, as I did, I saw David Thibodeau and some others walking up to the front gate with their hands in the air, 
and it was the first time I realized that others had got out besides myself, and not only that, but some of them had come from the same area, and I hadn't even seen them leave. Everything was so pitch black, they'd walked right past me and, uh, and managed to get out. So I decided to follow them. And as I rounded the corner of the drive, some perhaps 60, 70 yards behind uh, three or four individuals ahead of me, uh, I presume it was an FBI agent over near the tree who was dressed in camouflage, yelled at me to come over to him, and I kind of staggered over there and limped over there. I didn't realize my left ankle was burned, uh, the right side of my face was burned, and both hands, and, and I was in a kind of a great deal of pain, and the ground was all chewed up like it had been plowed because of the tanks. So I hobbled over to him and he was screaming at me that he would blow my so-and-so head off if I didn't, uh, you know, if I made a false move and keep my hands up and come over here because he wanted to know where the children were. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to tell him. I didn't know. I'd been sick all day the day before and had stayed in my bed and I was pretty sick most of the 19th so that I'd laid on the floor of the chapel between the pews most of the morning trying to keep my head out of the direct contact with these ferret rounds and so I wasn't much help. I made suggestions that maybe they were in the bass because I didn't know that they blocked the entrance. Uh, I said normally they're upstairs uh, with the mothers uh, and I might just make this comment that on the 28th all the rooms that you see the ATF agents firing into on the second floor were all, all had women and children in them. They were all where the children stayed, that whole front row and around both corners were rooms with women and children in. But anyway, since I wasn't much help to him and he ordered me to go on up to the gate and be arrested with, along with the rest of them. So I staggered away from him and with his threats in my ears that he was, you know, if I made one false move, I, he'd blow my head off. I got up to the gate and uh, when I got there, there were four of those that had come out of the fire, four men, uh, already laying on the ground handcuffed. I was told to start a new row behind them, uh, to get out and face down on the ground, and I was handcuffed in spite of the burns. And uh, it was about that time I saw the huge fireball that so many have seen on the videos go off and I pretty well wrote everybody off at that point. I figured there's no one going to get out of there after that. And, uh, but all of a sudden, Ruth Riddle was brought up and laid down beside me. Ruth had jumped out of a window, I found out later, and in the process had broken her ankle. Her, her knees, and her legs were burned, not very badly, but enough to be painful. And she was put down beside me and some agent, FBI agent, I presume, uh, grabbed her by the hair and was jerking her head back and forth, screaming at her, what's your name? Uh, tell us where the children are. And Ruth, who was in shock and in pain, wasn't answering. I didn't understand why. And uh, I heard a voice off to my right saying, you better quit that, they're taking pictures. And so he let go of her hair, you know, from jerking her head around and, and let her go. And he turned to me and he says, what's her name? She won't answer me. And I said, w I'd already given my name. They'd already taken uh, pictures of us laying on the ground and so forth. And I didn't understand exactly why she wasn't answering. I asked her later during the trial when I had an opportunity to talk to her and she said she was just in so much pain and shock that, you know, it's not that she was being hard-headed or anything, but at that point, when he asked me what her name was, I says, look, I don't know why she doesn't respond, why she's not answering. I says, but that's her right. We're told, you know, that you don't have to say anything and, uh, unless you have your lawyer present. So I didn't know whether that was her reason or not, but I says, if she doesn't want to answer, then I'm not going to tell you her name either. That's her privilege. And I says, I don't know her reasons. Shortly after that, <clears throat> uh, I was put in a Bradley, somebody, uh, in command uh, made a decision that I was bad enough and they put me in a Bradley and 
felt like you were being dragged down the road on your stomach, but uh, they did take me to a medical tent where I was given morphine and it was decided by the doctors there to send me to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. I passed out on the helicopter. I don't remember when I arrived or when I woke up. But as I said, I'd pretty well written off everybody in the building, including my own daughter, my 18. Mr. Doyle, I know it's been tough on you. You've told us your story. I you think you'll have an opportunity to answer questions okay. and can do more uh, at, at later date. We've been very okay. lenient in the time because of the circumstances, and we're going to have a couple of presentations. There will also be a little deviation from what we normally would do. Mr. Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had uh, many, several questions for Mr. Quinteri, but I think I understand he has a presentation, and the presentation will answer my question. So why don't I just well, ask him? Ask what it takes for the presentation. Thank you. Mr. Quinteri, if you would uh, do that, I think that might be helpful to all of us. I have a statement that I'd like to read, and uh, at some point I'd like to show a video if that's... You may, you may proceed, Mr. Quinteri. Okay. All right. Shortly after the fire of the Branch Davidian compound at uh, Waco, Texas, on August 19, 1993, I was asked to contribute to the fire investigation. In doing so, I enlisted the support of Dr. Fred Maurer, also of the Department of Fire Protection Engineering at the Excuse University me, of sir, Maryland. Excuse me, would you just pull the microphone up a little more closely? Thank you. We visited the Waco fire site during April 22nd to the 24th. At that time, we joined a team under uh, Paul Gray, who's at my left, from Houston, and that team also consisted of Thomas Hitchings of Pittsburgh, William Cass of Los Angeles, and John Ricketts of San Francisco. The group under Paul Gray would focus on the cause and origin of the fire. We would analyze the development of the fire and draw interpretations and conclusions from that analysis. Principally, we had visual data to work from. The fire had completely leveled the compound so that no significant structural remains were available to establish the development of this fire. However, this fire was probably one of the most extensively recorded fires in history. Not only were commercial television stations continuously recording this event, but surveillance government planes were taking still photographs and using a forward-looking infrared, known as a FLIR, F-L-I-R, video. That's an infrared video. These visual records became the principal source of our data for this analysis. The video and photographic data were made available to us by the FBI. Video copies of the data we requested were given to us at the F FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. on April 25th. Subsequently, the FBI video and photo laboratories supplied additional materials and support as requested during our investigation. The data included television coverage of the fire by the Canadian Broadcast Corporation and by Channel 10 Waco. These were representative of the commercial statement, uh, uh, stations that were recording. Also, we had the FLIR, the IR video recording and aerial photographs. These covered the period of the fire, approximately 12 noon central daylight time to approximately 12.30. The principal source of the data to establish the inception of the fires and their locations is the FLIR video. Based on the calibrated clock of the FLIR, this was calibrated to, do, uh, to the national standard time, I believe, the, the uh, uh, day before they used it. That was used as our official time. There is a time also on the Canadian broadcast tape. It's Eastern time, not Central time, and it's off by 19 seconds. So we were able to use the FLIR video as the official uh, time, uh, uh, if you will, in this study. From this visual data, I was able to determine the point of origin of the fires, their growth rates, and estimates of the fire energy output rates at critical transition points in their development. 
I also drew conclusions on the nature of the ignition sources, the role of the tear gas, the effect of the wind, and the survivability time of the occupants. I will summarize these conclusions and how they were determined. In addition to this statement, I would like our official report and a video I made for the criminal trial to be submitted for the record of this hearing. Both will be accepted Mr. without Chairman, objection. Uh, reserving the right to object. Yes, uh, Mr. Barr. I need, need a little clarification because I'm not sure how this fits in with what I understand our established procedures were. This was a tape prepared by whom? This was prepared by the FBI laboratory under my direction so that I could use that as an aid in explaining the fire development uh, for the criminal trial of the Branch Davidians. Okay. And that was used, it was used in that trial. Uh, okay, and you referred to a, something called a FLIR video? The FLIR video. Which is uh, the infrared? There, yes. Uh, aerial and there, and video. on the video, there will be segments of the FLIR, segments of the commercial stations, and some still photographs. And they will be labeled so that I could explain uh, more completely uh, how we, you know, examine this fire and what we saw. Okay. And what uh, we determined. Mr. Chairman, uh, as I understand, I, there is another video, the FLIR video, uh, which is more comprehensive in terms of showing the entry and, and egress of the tank and, and uh, the, the different points of the fire. Uh, will we be able to there's introduce more, portions more, of that? If there's a complete video that goes along with this, then we'd be glad to have it in here. The objective of these hearings, this set of hearings, is to demonstrate as best as possible what happened to the fire and try to debunk the theories that are wrong and come to some conclusions. We cannot do this type of a hearing without video. So if there's something that you feel is not being properly presented here, we'll consult with the ranking members and we'll be glad to augment it. But the objective is to bring everything forward here today. That's uh, the objective. Okay, then if, uh, just for clarification, then, then we, we will be able to uh, utilize the other, the other video then it, if we allow if this If we one. have it available and we can produce it in a timely manner, we certainly would. Okay, thank you. Reserving the right to object, Mr. Chairman. Yes, you may reserve the right to object, Mr. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, also for clarification now, since we are, by your last statement, obviously trying to get the whole truth, has the chairman changed his mind on allowing the two reporters from the Waco paper to come testify before this committee and the woman who claims she was held against her will and the woman who claims Koresh had compiled a hit list? I have, are, are you going to allow them not, to testify uh, before you, Of course, committee? your request is going predominantly to Mr. Zeloff, who's your subcommittee chairman in this dual hearing. But, but, none the, but nonetheless, I will answer you. But nonetheless, I will answer you on your reservation. I have not changed my mind, as I indicated, and I join and concur in Mr. Zellos' view. The witnesses who you wish to call, the newspaper reporters, and those who were involved in the other uh, aspects of what happened in, in Waco in terms of being participants in some fashion, are redundant and duplicative. We are attempting here today to get at the fire. Uh, we're not attempting to get at telling the broad story picture, other than that we presented one Davidian, which was by mutual agreement earlier, to tell this story. And we could have presented a whole panel of Davidians. There has to be a finite limit to how we proceed in order to go and through Mr. these hearings. Mr. Chairman, you're exactly right. There also has to be a reason for the government to have got involved in the first place. And that is, the, that is what I would like the people of this country to know. All right. Now, all, right. all right, the regular order is that we're at the point now where the request has been made by the witnesses to present this <coughs> material and evidence. If there's objection, it will not be admitted into evidence. And this hearing, at least for the moment, will come to an end, and we will not proceed. It's as simple as that, because we cannot have this hearing without the evidence that's here for them, vi visual evidence. This, this will not work. We've heard Mr. Doyle, but that'll be it. So the, uh, at any rate, uh, is there objection to Mr. this Chairman, material? reserving the right to object. Mr. Boyer? I do have a question about when he's mentioned a FLIR video. Is this a FLIR video that was shot on the day of the fire? Yes. And yes. was, it, was it by military aircraft or by FBI? I couldn't tell you that. So we don't know who shot from what type of aircraft it's, it's, from which it was it's, shot? It's a government aircraft. Uh, Paul Gray is telling me it's a FBI aircraft. All right. Uh, and uh, it was shot for more than just the time of this fire. And the segments that I have used are from the, right, uh, the, the, the period of the fire. And that's the most relevant, I think, to my right, testimony. Thank you. I, I, do, I, I with draw my reservation. Without objection, the data will be admitted. We will be in recess until five minutes after the vote is in progress.
We'll be back with more testimony in a few moments. During the Waco hearing, some news stories reported on tensions between members of the committee. We asked several reporters about that. One was Washington Times reporter Lori Kelman. Well, it was to be expected. Um, classic, uh, a classic tactic when your party is under attack is to say that the hearings are politically motivated and not a whole lot of news going to come out. It's a waste of time and taxpayers' money. So that was to be expected. What I don't think anybody expected, including the Republicans, was the extent to which the Democrats uh, planned on obst obstructing things. They, they really dominated things for hours at a time, especially the first couple of days. And um, Co Congressman Zeliff in particular was not prepared for that. He, he told me he was flustered and, and caught by surprise by it. Um, and, and it's something that the Republicans, as they do oversight hearings from now on, will need to be better prepared for um, if they intend to keep their hearings focused. And one of the reasons these hearings were delayed two days, went on two days longer, is because they just couldn't grab hold of of the, um, of the delaying tactics used by the Democrats. Uh, one thing that your viewers may not have noticed in terms of nuance is that the co-chairman, Representative Bill Zeliff in New Hampshire, uh, was constantly making the point that President Clinton was, you know, deeply involved. Uh, there was a Washington Times story beforehand that said that, you know, this might lead to impeach impeachment proceedings somehow without any real specificity is what he was talking about. He was constantly critical of the president. He went on the national talk shows on Sunday. I uh, made a statement that we're going to have, you know, the equivalent of a smoking gun and we're going to have new information about the president's uh, involvement. He also happens to be a Bob Dole campaign official in New Hampshire. <laughs> so there is some, uh, you know, incentive for him to do that. And um, in the end, there was no smoking gun. There was no new evidence. And uh, Zelov continued to be critical. And at one point I asked him at a press conference, I said, well, I'm confused. Are you saying the president was too involved or not involved enough? A and he kind of was stunned by the question and really didn't have an answer for it. So it was just a matter of just throw it out there and criticize without really having anything in, in, in specific to go after. Tomorrow, day nine of the Waco hearings. The witnesses include a panel of FBI special agents. And on Friday, we'll air the final day of the House hearings with testimony from Attorney General Janet Reno. Labor Day weekend on C-SPAN. We mark the 50th anniversary of VJ Day, the end of the war with Japan. Among the programs, live coverage of a joint services review at Wheeler Air Force Base in Honolulu, Hawaii. President Clinton will speak at the event Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. We now return to final coverage of Day 8 of the Waco hearings. Witnesses are Paul Gray of the Houston Fire Department and fire expert Rick Shero. We'll also hear more testimony from arson expert James Quintere and former Branch Davidian Clive Doyle. Joint uh, subcommittees will come to order. I do not believe we'll have any more interruptions this afternoon because we have now completed business on the floor of the House. Uh, we do have a very serious business to do here, though, and we will be here for the duration of completing that. When we recessed for the last vote on the floor, Mr. Scott's time had expired in the process of asking Mr. Pintera to explain uh, the fire uh, evidence that he had. He was in the process of giving us a statement, and we had just accepted into the record some a documentary evidence which you wished us to, and now you may proceed, Mr. Quintero. Okay. And, and I'll depart somewhat from that statement uh, so that I can narrate uh, the video. That would be uh, fine. And uh, as I pointed out, this video was composed uh, through the FBI laboratory under my direction so that I could use it in the Branch Davidian uh, criminal trial. It has on it the flare excerpts from the Canadian broadcast uh, tape excerpts from Channel 10 of Waco, 
and some still photographs that were taken uh, overhead by an aircraft. Uh, okay, let's start the video. I might add that Mr. Doyle and Mr. Gray are not in their seats. If somebody would notify them, not that they're testifying now, it would be helpful. Please proceed. Okay, what we're going to see is, this is approximately at 12 noon. If we can just hold it there for a second. Uh, this is an aerial uh, view of the compound as it existed uh, just several moments before the start of the fire. And you could see that there is a demolished area here in the front of the building. I will call this part the front of the building. There's some other demolition area here and here. So these are openings made by the tanks. Uh, significant openings and in the back the gymnasium is partially demolished in this debris pile that we see uh, here as well. Uh, I should point out that there was a very strong wind, a prevailing wind that was approximately 17 to 24 miles an hour from this direction going diagonally across. This is from the south to the north. Uh, as I said I'll refer to this as the front of the building. Uh, there were gusts in this wind, but principally we could say it was about 25 miles an hour. The building is principally of wood construction. The interior was gypsum board walls, perhaps gypsum board ceilings. Uh, the floor and roof were made of plywood. What we're going to see, let's start the tape. We're going to see how we synchronized uh, the three tapes. The tapes were run continuously, and as I said, we used the clock on the flare which was calibrated to the national standard. So that, we, we have a very good, precise record of the time. And we've synchronized this with the departure of a tank from this corner of the building. This is the right front corner of the building. Now you're looking at the black and white flare. Uh, the flare image is going to respond to temperature as well as reflected sunlight. Is as we go okay, let, why don't we just uh, pause there uh, for a moment and let me explain what a, what a flare is. A flare is uh, the symbol, the letters stand for forward-looking infrared. Let's just call that, you know, the infrared uh, video. Uh, the way this operated, it would uh, focus on the temperature that it would see in the field of view, and then it would set a temperature above and below that average temperature that it would see. So, for, for example, if the ground temperature was approximately 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it would set some limits above and below that, and that range was approximately 40 degrees above and below. That would set the gray scales. On the low end, we would have see it as black. On the high end, we would see it as white. So if something in this screen changed from gray or black to white, we could be sure that in the early stages of this fire, it was attaining at least a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how sensitive this flare is. Uh, my sense is that this is used for surveillance, and it's used for night vis vision, and it's able to see people, even though there may be no uh, sunlight or artificial light available. Uh, so it is very sensitive. At about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it would become saturated, and at that point, you would just see white. So at some point in this fire, the flare doesn't become very valuable because the entire screen is mostly white from the heat of the fire. Another advantage that the flare has is that because of its longer wavelength, it's operating between 8 and 12 micrometers, where our eye is more like 0.6 micrometers, much, much lower. Because of that higher wavelength, it can penetrate through smoke sort of like an x-ray. And in that sense, the flare enables us to see through smoke about 20 times more than our naked eye. Now, once that smoke gets very hot and very thick, then it can't see through it anymore. It becomes saturated because of its scale. But the advantage is, in the early part of this fire, the flare not only is very sensitive to the small temperature rise, but it allows you to see through smoke that might have obscured parts of the building and the fire development. So this is very critical in uh, discerning what is taking place. OK, and we we'll, can start the tape. And you can simply see how we're uh, uh, 
uh, correlating the times. You'll notice the time here. This is the Canadian broadcast time. That is not the correct time. That is Eastern time, and it's 19 seconds off. So this time should be disregarded on what we see in the future. There was actually a time recorded on the flare, and that could be, was obvious uh, in reviewing carefully uh, the tapes. And what I had to do is go back and forth in looking at these independent tapes. This is Waco Channel 10, and you see the tank departing from that point. Now what we're going to see is the first fire is going to occur in this room. And it will occur one and a half minutes approximately after the tank leaves. All right. It is difficult sometimes to see this. You have to look at it carefully. So I'll try to call your attention to it. If you look at this point here, you will see this window begin to turn slightly grayish. It does right now. If we Nine seconds later, the window on the opposite side, right here, is going to also show an illumination, which is due to this temperature rise. And in my opinion, that's due to smoke being transported from the fire started at one end of the room to the other end of the room. That occurs about nine seconds later. So at 12.07.42, approximately a minute and a half after the tank has left that location, we have the onset of a fire. Uh, in this view right here, you see it uh, in, in this uh, point. It's at second floor. This is probably a bedroom. The room is about 16 by 11 in dimensions, about eight foot high, we might imagine that there would be uh, beds or mattresses in that room. In this general location, uh, I think I counted about seven uh, box springs uh, from mattresses. Okay. So that is the start of the first fire. Now we'll see the start of the second fire. This is uh, much more difficult to discern. You have to watch the tape a few times. What we will see is some smoke rising from this point. And that will occur approximately after a minute from the first fire. Now, if some of you just saw this flash here, that is a momentary event. In my opinion, that's a reflection due to sunlight reflecting off some object in that debris. There is no thermal effect that persists there. So whatever it was, it's momentary. Yeah, at this point, in this vicinity right here, there was a column of faint smoke rising. I admit that it's difficult for you to see at first looking at this. One has to study this at some time, for some periods. You'll notice that the back of the tank here is illuminated due to the fact that that's where the hot engine is. So one minute later, we have a fire now on the first floor in the rear of the dining room. In that area, I did note in the uh, debris of the fire that there were about 20 burned uh, stacked chairs. So that could have been a possible site for the beginning of this fire. Here you see a, a, a split screen uh, in which we have the flare on the left and uh, the uh, Canadian broadcast tape on the right, and from this you can see the difference between what you would see with your naked eye and what the flare uh, sees. And I call your attention to the fact that sometimes you will see a large amount of smoke on the right and not that much on the left, and that's because we're able to see through that smoke uh, with the infrared. We are looking at the development of the fire uh, in that uh, bedroom area, the second floor uh, right tower. Right, what we're going to see here at 1209.42, we will see an event uh, known to people uh, who investigate and study fire. That event is called flashover. And that's a point when we have a transition in this fire in which the fire goes from a discrete uh, uh, object that you could discern very readily 
burning in a room such as this to a point where flames now fill the room. And that transition can occur in seconds. It is known as flashover. Before that time, the room might be survivable. After that time, is definitely not. And now the fire is a threat to spreading to other rooms. We can discern flashover on this when flames come out of this window. And that's an indication of fire filling that space. The other thing you should notice is that, that the flames come out into that nearly 25 mile an hour wind. And you might ask, how could that be? The only way that could be is if there are some barriers back here, closed doors or windows that don't allow the wind to blow through that area. And for that reason, the wind is not having a significant effect on the fire development in that room and in that area. All right, it is acting as if there is no wind. There is basically what people call in fluid mechanics a stagnation point at that, in that region. Now we are continuing on in time and we'll backtrack in a moment to pick up some of the other fires, but you definitely see the second fire here. And actually here in this debris area, you will see what might be a fourth fire or connected to the third. And we'll go over those in a moment. This is the inception of the third fire. This will be on the first floor in the chapel. The chapel was the largest space in which, this, uh, in which the three fires started. This is a space that is approximately, I think, 60 by 40 feet. Uh, it is a single story space with a higher ceiling. And right at that point there, you see the onset of the uh, thermal image that indicates a uh, fire or hot gases at that point. Now, uh, some 45 feet away approximately from that point, that window point, uh, in the debris area here, we will see an uh, emergence right now of some uh, hot gases. And that could be a separately set fire. If we look at the time duration between these two events, it's approximately 38 seconds. That's consistent also with if someone were to put a trail of gasoline or some other liquid fuel between those two points and allow the fire to spread over that uh, trail, it would take approximately the same time. So it may have been connected with the starting of the uh, third fire. Here we're just going to see an aerial uh, photo. This is about the same time that we were just looking at. You see the way the smoke to the naked eye would have obscured most of that building with the flare giving us the ability to look through it and see the onset of these fires. As I said, as the smoke becomes hotter and denser, then the flare would saturate and the image on the flare is not as valuable to us anymore. Okay, let's, let's go on. We will now see flashover in the dining room. And if you were observing flashover carefully for the first flyer, you would have seen that the walls of that room and that area actually began to become illuminated as heat was penetrating through those walls. And shortly thereafter that event took place, flames came out of the window. Therefore, we can almost calibrate this flare and say when we see a heat pattern coming through the walls of a room, it is likely that there is tremendous heat, hot gases inside, and that room is ripe to go to flashover. And we will, we, you will see that in this area here. You'll also see the roof getting hot and even uh, flecks of hot uh, uh, airborne debris uh, moving up like firebrands. Uh, from this fire. Here you can see, we just sort of went by it, but you can, you can see here in this area uh, the uh, thermal image coming through the walls. In addition to that, uh, flashover could be determined in this area by noting the smoke coming out the front left corner of the building. Previously to that, the smoke did not significantly come out. When flashover occurred in the dining room, there was a, uh, a flashover gives us a, a very large, rapid uh, release of energy. 
that gives rise to a slight pressure increase and that will push smoke out of areas where it wasn't coming out before. And in this case, it can push it out directly into the wind. And that was one of the characteristics of the dining room fire, so therefore flashover could be noted there as well. The significance of flashover is the time from ignition to flashover and, and the speed at which that occurring is an indication of, uh, you might say, uh, perhaps how this fire was growing and how it could be related to other things we know about the way fires grow. These fires were rapidly developing, developing fires. They could be listed in a, in a a relative way as fast to ultra fast developing fires in those two locations. Uh, this is the CBT, uh, CBC tape and it just shows smoke evolving from this point indicative of uh, flashover. Here you can still see flames uh, emerging from this window into the wind. You can notice the wind and the way the wind is affecting the smoke. We'll now look at the onset of uh, flashover for the chapel. The chapel is the largest space, and it took a flashover about four minutes to occur in that much larger space, indicating that uh, that fire, in my opinion, was encouraged uh, to grow rapidly. We can note flashover in the chapel by the fact that we will see a puff of black smoke come out the front door here, that large opening, uh, made by one of the tank vehicles, and you could see it there. As we pass through flashover and we have a fully developed fire, the fire will equilibrate, this pressure pulse will die away, and now after that we will, see, we will not see smoke coming out in the same way. If we can just pause at this point, you can see uh, the fire here, the first fire. A minute later, a fire began in the dining room area. And a minute after that, a fire began in this chapel. It has not burned through the roof yet, but the ignition in the debris area, because of the wind, has now propagated uh, significantly over that debris area. These are three distinct fires. Uh, from this information, I can conclude that these three fires that occurred nearly one minute apart were intentionally set from within the compound. Even if a tank battering had caused spillage of some fuel, perhaps from a lamp, a match would be needed to initiate the fire. If the lamp were lit when the tank knocked it over, if you presume that happened, because of the sensitivity of the flare, we would have seen that. And you saw that the only chance that a tank might have done something like that is a minute and a half before a fire occurred in that first location. So that is, that is not possible. Uh, if there was a spillage, it needs at least an electric spark to ignite it. That could have happened if there was electricity available. The electricity, the power was shut off to the compound. Therefore, even if there was a spillage of something due to this battering, someone would have to put a match in it to ignite it. So it is obvious to me that these three fires needed an ignition source deliberately placed in each of these three locations. Also, you have the time periods involved and the very discrete, different locations. None of these three fires could have caused any of the others because their growth rates would not provide sufficient heating to cause such remote ignitions. In other words, this fire is not putting out enough heat to cause a fire on the first floor in the dining room. 
Any external heat source that might have been used to start the fire would have clearly been visible, as you could see from the infrared. And this was not seen. Although normal furnishings and interior construction characteristics would provide a means for fire propagation, the more than usual rapid spread of these fires, especially in the dining room and the chapel areas, indicates to me that some form of, of accelerant was used to encourage the rapid spread of these fires. Now if we can go on with the tape. This is approximately uh, 11 minutes, or I should say at approximately 11 minutes after the start of the fire, the flames will merge over the compound. The fire was probably detected on the FLIR uh, as low as something like 50 kilowatts. That's a fire about this big. All right, you can get your arms around that. Now when these flames merge, approximately uh, 11 minutes later, uh, we have uh, three and a half million kilowatts estimated in this fire. The black smoke, I might add, is probably due to the fact that we have a fuel-rich fire. Inside, we're not getting enough air to the uh, 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 materials that are now decomposing, uh, producing the fuel in this fire. Uh, you might have seen in that segment that a person actually jumped off the roof and walked away. Uh, that person had, uh, had climbed out of one of the windows previously and had lied on the roof for uh, some period of time. You'll notice that in areas here, there is no more smoke coming out. Uh, if people were in this area at this time, uh, it might have been uh, uh, possible to survive uh, this fire in some of those locations. We just hold it there for a second. Uh, there was a significant event that I, I did not point out, and some of you may have seen it. Uh, at 12:19 uh, and 15 seconds, a person did jump from uh, one of the windows on the second floor. And uh, if that wasn't obvious to any of you, or you wanted me to go back and show that later, we can we can do that. At this point, let's just move on. Here you see this rather dramatic event of this uh, fireball. There's some debris that appears to be in it. Uh, what it is, I cannot say for sure, but based on its duration and its height uh, and the size of the diameter of the fireball, one can estimate uh, what, how much fuel was suddenly released to cause that. This is being caused from a rupture of some kind of tank or some kind of sudden release of energy. And that is equivalent to as an estimation, 93 pounds of propane. So it would be consistent with a 100-pound tank of propane that might have been used for heating or cooking purposes in the compound. I'm not saying it is a tank of propane. It is consistent with a tank of propane rupturing. Let's move on. And if you could trace it back down, it looks like it's in the vicinity of the uh, tall uh, tower in the center or next to the kitchen area. Uh, there is a person that walks across the front of the building at this time. 
where they exited from, uh, it's not clear, but the person that jumped from this window apparently went into the debris area here and will be seen being rescued by an agent uh, shortly. This is a person who has ex exited the building from someplace. I can't determine from this vantage point, but uh, subsequently we will see a person being rescued from this area uh, at this time. This is now uh, uh, 21 minutes after the start of this fire. And you can see that the building is collapsing in places. And uh, it's pretty much fully involved. This is the surrender of one of the occupants. You will now see an agent run and rescue the person from this area. Certainly, I would suggest that uh, if that agent wasn't cited for that act, he, he should be uh, uh, commended for that. If we could just hold, hold it at that point, I would like to conclude with a couple of remarks based on my estimates of survivability of the occupants in the compound and on the, uh, the tear gas and uh, uh, what it might have done in this, in this fire. Uh, I've estimated, these are, these are rough estimates, but I, th I think they're pretty reasonable, that the occupants would have had uh, sufficient warning uh, in, in no doubt that the, 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 the uh, uh, fire occurred and this would have enabled them to escape for up to five minutes from the start of that first fire or perhaps as many as 20 minutes in some protected areas of the building. So between an interval of five minutes after the fire started and maybe as much as 20 minutes, a person could have escaped from some parts of that building. This was dramatically seen, and I'm sorry I didn't point it out, from a person jumping from one of the second floor windows where conditions of this fire would have been much worse than the first floor because we all know heat rises and that's where the smoke is going to collect and the hot gases. That person jumped from that window at uh, 12 minutes after the start of the first fire. The exits were within about 30 feet of almost any point, you know, from the perimeter of, of this building. Uh, people knew the building, and there were some large openings in there that were put in by the tanks that could have facilitated people walking out. Carbon monoxide in the smoke would have been the primary threat, in my opinion, to the occupants. This is the threat to most people that are not intimate with the fire and the way most people die in fire. However, preliminary autopsy reports that I had available to me indicated that only five of 31 victims where carbon monoxide was recorded. So where 31 victims had recorded data on carbon monoxide, only five of those would have been considered lethal. That would be over 50% carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, hence, if these data are correct, at least 26 of these victims did not die due to the fire. The autopsy report goes on to indicate that in at least 27 of the victims, gunshot wounds could be attributed to the cause of death. Let me address the tear gas. 
The tear gas is composed of methylene chloride, which is a liquid that forms an aerosol droplet around the CS itself, which is the ingredient uh, that makes your eyes tear and, and cough. So the methylene chloride, my understanding is its role is just as a dispersal agent. It is the more flammable of the two components, that is, between CS uh, and methylene chloride. Uh, as a vapor in air, under normal conditions, it's flammable at 12%. In other words, anything above 12% to approximately 20, it would be in the flammable range. And if we had a spark or a small match, and if we had conditions like that, we would have fire propagating through the atmosphere, much like a fireball. There was no observations like that made for this fire. In addition, if you look at methylene chloride as a liquid, which it would normally be uh, uh, under, under these conditions, it, it boils at something like 109 degrees Fahrenheit. So as it's dispersed into this compound with the CS, it would start to evaporate and may puddle in some pools if they put a lot in. And in those liquid pools, if one tried to ignite it, it would actually put out a match. And this is due to the chlorine in that compound. So in some sense, it acts like an inhibitor. Uh, recently, I conducted some additional experiments to assess the role of the methylene chloride as a wetting agent. All right. So if, if it deposited on wood or paper or things like that that would burn in this compound. And uh, uh, it would be then absorbed since it's normally a liquid. From my experiments, I can conclude that the methylene chloride had no enhancement effect on the fire spread over the room furnishings and other things that burned in the compound. Also, I can conclude from the literature information about CS, the point where it will ignite, it, that temperature is comparable to what we would find for most fuels around us. So in my opinion, based upon that, the CS itself as a powder would not enhance any fire spread. And I could elaborate on, on those experiments and that issue. So I can say that the tear gas had no bearing on the propagation of this fire. On the effect of wind. Wind effects did have a profound effect on the external fire spread over the compound. An approximately 25 mile an hour wind from the south caused the fire plume to be bent at approximately 65 degrees with the vertical when the fire fully involved the compound. And I said at this point, that firepower was probably about three and a half million kilowatts compared to the inception that we saw on the flare, which is estimated to be about 50 kilowatts. The flame length was 240 feet long. Wind effects did not appear to have a significant effect on the fire growth within the compound. Uh, these were seen by the flames emerging from that window directly into the wind. So from that point there, that fire was behaving as if there was no wind, and it was probably due to some closure, doors closed or other obstacles behind uh, that room. The tank made openings on the front of the compound could have had some effect on fire growth over the first floor, but more significantly could have provided air to areas of refuge for some of the occupants. During the weeks preceding the fire at the Branch Davidian compound, we were all bystanders to the drama of the standoff, and we wondered how it would end. The eventual outcome was a horrible event. In the two years since, many theories about the fire have been proposed, some quite bizarre. I hope this presentation, uh, our report that we drafted, and I'd like to submit that for the record, and, and the video, uh, I hope that will help to explain the events of this fire. We're going back to regular order now, Mr. Quintier. We thank you for that. Before I recognize Mr. Schiff, I just want to point out to you that you're going to be given this tape, which is nothing more than a copy of what you already have you know about so that you can prepare it uh, for when Mr. Shattig or others may wish to question you about it. Mr. Schiff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Quintier, you, how do you, could you say your name again, Quintier. sir? Quintier. excuse me. Quintier. Quintier. Um, Mr. Quintier, uh, you've stated that you believe, I still have it wrong, would you say it again? Quintier. 
Quintieri. Okay, excuse me. Mr. Quintieri, I want to say you have rejected the idea of the grenades and the methylene chloride having anything to do with, with the fire. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Let me ask the other two fire experts here, uh, Mr. Sherrill and Mr. Gray, do you agree with that or do either of you believe that the use of the uh, pyrotechnics or the chemicals in the, in the ferret rounds, the gas grenades, could have contributed to the fire? Uh, Mr. Gray? First of all, they were not pyrotechnic uh, canisters. And I totally agree with Mr. Quintier. Right. Mr. Sherrill, may I ask you the same question? Uh, the information I have to this date, there were no pyrotechnics involved. Uh, the idea of the methylene chloride, uh, I agree with the doctor on once it's in a liquid form. However, it is a safety hazard when it is in a vapor form as it's originally injected. There is a possibility, but it's something that has to be explored a lot more. So, Mr. Sher Mr. Shero, your opinion is it's a possibility, but uh, you would leave it as possibility right now? At this point, yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Quintier, I want to ask that you said that the proof of arson was that these, uh, these fires to begin required a match. I believe Some, that was something like that. Yes. Well, I think that's pretty much you use the word match. Spark or match. If, it would, if we had a flammable liquid, it would require something like that. It, but it wouldn't necessarily require a match, would it? Uh, as I said, if it were a flammable liquid, we could ignite the vapors with a spark. Or with a flame that spilled on it? Okay, a any, what you mean is not a match, which is the word you use. A flame. A flame. Sure. But you didn't say the word flame, you said the word match. And the point I'm getting at is, it is my understanding that there were uh, lanterns being used for, uh, for light uh, because the electricity was turned off in the compound. Do you have the same understanding? Yes. Is it, is it possible that lanterns could have overturned and, and caused or contributed to this fire? Uh, it is possible, but the lantern would have to have been lit, and somebody would have to turn over those lanterns. In the, in the area of the first fire, there had been a tank there a minute and a half before, and one might, that might suggest that it knocked over a lantern. However, as I said, due to the sensitivity of the flare, had that lantern been lit and knocked over, we would have seen it at that time on the flare, because the flare is going to respond to a very low temperature rise and a very small fire, and that fire would have been, been more than consistent with a spilled lamp. So the fire was consistent with a spilled lantern or was, was not? I'm, I'm going to ask you to restate that. What I'm, what I'm saying is that somebody would have had to have turned over three lanterns in those locations. If, it, if a lantern was the starting point of this fire, all right? And how do you know a lantern? I, I cannot tell you precisely how these fires were lit. Well, if there were lanterns in use, and if you had either through vibrations of tanks hitting walls or through a number of people panicking uh, inside at, at, at what they might have perceived was an assault, notwithstanding the FBI broadcast going to them, uh, couldn't either or both of those factors have easily overturned lanterns inside the compound? Well, the only evidence we have of a tank being in the vicinity of one of the fires is the first fire, and that tank has, has now left a minute and a half after the fire has begun. If that tank knocked over a lantern and the lantern were lit, we would have seen it in, in that flare video because it would have been sensitive enough to see that. If the tank had spilled a lantern and there was no flame there to ignite it, that's possible, but somebody would have to come and put a flame in that. What if people running around, and I'm trying to picture what it must yeah. have been like inside the compound. What if people running around knocked over a lantern? Is that possible? Of course it's possible. I, I want to ask, what was the FBI's fire plan in case that there was a fire during their, their plan to end the siege? I have no knowledge of that. Did you ever ask them what their fire plan was? No, because right. that, that wasn't what I was asked to right. look Mr. at. Mr. Gray, did you ever ask the FBI what their fire plan was, or did you know what it was? I did not. Uh, Mr. Shero, are you aware of, of uh, what the FBI's fire plan was as a contingency in case a fire started from any cause during this attempt to end the siege? No, sir, not at all. Does anyone know if the FBI had a fire plan? I don't believe so. 
Mr. Shero, it's my understanding you are uh, uh, you are now retired from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, no, sir, I'm retired from the United States Army. I worked for six years for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and okay. Firearms. Okay, Th thank you. But you did work for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Yes, sir. All right. Um, I, I, I see my time has expired, but if I have additional time, I'd like to come back to you on that and also to you, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Mr. Schumer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to ask Mr. Quintieri uh, some questions. Quint Quintieri? Thank you. Um, some questions. Uh, we've heard a number of different theories, and I just want to bring this out. Your testimony was excellent, but somewhat arcane. Uh, and um, since I've had a chance to study it, I just want to bring these out. We've had a number of theories about how the fire started, and I want to ask you, for each theory, was what you observed consistent with that theory or not? The first is from the transcript that I read earlier today of what happened inside the compound, that people in the compound poured gas or some kind of flammable substance, they call it gas here, on the floors, and then later, three people in different parts, well, the transcript doesn't prove that, and then they lit, lit that gas. Would that be consistent well, that with what you said? That would be consistent saw? with what I concluded. It would be consistent that the fire was started deliberately, it's yes. not necessarily true, but it would be consistent that the fire was started deliberately by people who poured gas and then lit a match to it. Yes. Okay. A second theory, and you went over this a little bit with Mr. Schiff, is that the fire started when lanterns were knocked over by tanks. Would that be consistent with what we observed on the uh, tape? In only one case where the tank was at the first location and it could have knocked over a lantern, but then someone right. had to light that right. fuel spill so, a minute and a half later. Right, so it would not be consistent. It would not be consistent with the tank starting the fire. Correct. Now, a second theory was that people were running around and maybe knocked them over. I will not ask you a question on this because that's just speculation. But what I find puzzling about that speculation is the tear gas was injected for six hours, and within one minute, or one and a half minutes, three different people accidentally knocked over three different lanterns in three different parts of the building. You'd have to have that to have the running around theory make sense. Yes, fire yeah. is very rare, and for fire to develop in three locations a minute apart, is almost impossible right. without someone intentionally now, doing that. Another theory that we've heard mentioned is that a flamethrower from the tanks started the fire. Now, as I understand it, we would have to have seen on the FLIR a hot streak going from the tank to the building for that to happen. Absolutely. And we did not. Is that correct? Absolutely. If so you're know you saying that a flamethrower from the tank starting the fire, is that consistent is that theory consistent with what we saw on the tape? No, indeed. No. There is no such thing as flame okay. on those. Okay. A fields. final theory is that methylene chloride started the fire, and you talked about that a little bit, but I just want to ask you so we get it on the record clearly that methylene chloride or tear gas was somehow ignited and started the fire. Methylene chloride is... Well, I just want to ask you a yes or no question. Is it consistent no. with what you saw no. that methylene, methylene chloride... Methylene chloride did not start or contribute to this right. fire. Because if somehow a gas cloud was ignited, as I understand it, there would be a huge blowout, not just three right. separate fires in different Absolutely. parts of the compound, but one big sort of whoosh, Absolutely. and everything would go up. Okay. So in other words, to summarize... The only theory of those four, we may find others, but of those four, which are the four that I have heard most commonly mentioned, the only one that would be consistent with what you observed was that the fire was started internally by somebody. Yes. Okay. Now, okay, um, have, are there any other theories that you haven't touched on? that we have heard bandied about, either by critics of, uh, by people who are upset with what happened in Waco or not? Have, am I leaving any yeah, out? Not that I could think of at, at this time. Okay. And obviously this was a terrible, uh, terrible tragedy. But I get from your testimony, sir, it seems to me that there is no question that the 80 people who, who, who perished and others who suffered like Mr. Doyle were clearly without doubt victims. 
but in all likelihood, someone inside the compound was the victimizer. I yield back. I, I yield my remaining time to uh, Ms. Chairman. Mr. Gray, would you agree with the statements that have just been made? I 100% I agree with Dr. Quintieri. We were part of the same team. And if you don't mind, in the, in the interest of fairness here, I did prepare at the Chairman's request a, a statement that I would like to deliver. And I promise it will be shorter than the other ones you've heard today. Um, and I, I would like to, uh, I have it prepared. Can, Mr. Gray, uh, we don't want to uh, duplicate now, but I know that you have a good reputation for that. Uh, so uh, that's certainly on your time. If you yield for that purpose. I would yield for that purpose. My name is Paul Gray. I'm Assistant Chief of the Houston Fire Department's Arson Division. I'm in my 24th year as a professional firefighter, and I am proud to have spent my adult life as a member of this highly regarded and most respected profession. For the past 16 years, I've also held commissions by the state of Texas as a peace officer and certified fire investigator. I have worked closely with many state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies, and I've been recognized for my professionalism and job performance. I have received awards for meritorious service. I am certainly not without flaw, but my service record is. I am here today to assist in applying a medicinal dose of the truth to the still festering wound known as the Branch Davidian Incident near Waco, Texas. On April 19, 1993, from my Houston office, I watched live news coverage of the FBI's assault on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco. I remember having feelings similar to the ones I had as the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster unfolded on live television. As flames engulfed the compound, I kept watching for the sight of dozens of people safely escaping the building just as all of America prayed for the sight of parachutes silhouetted in the smoke-filled sky on that other sad day in 1986. As precious seconds passed and the inferno grew, I realized there would be no happy ending to this story as there was no happy landing for our astronauts seven years before. Terror, sorrow, sadness, anger, frustration, these and other inexpressible emotions of sympathy were evoked by those pictures. Then. On another morning in April, two years to the day after the fire in Waco, in a split second, all those emotions were reignited by an even greater catastrophe in Oklahoma City. I believe that if we are to fully comprehend where a person stands on an issue, it would help to know how he came to stand there. I would like to try and explain how I came to stand where I am today. I remember many years ago as a young firefighter and a paramedic, the exhilaration of helping save a life or the miraculous moment of birth. I remember crying over the lifeless body of a child because I was too late to help. I recall the sheer exhaustion of performing CPR until every muscle in my body ached. I'll never forget the helplessness of an accident victim staring into my eyes, grasping my collar in his fist, and pleading with me in his last breath not to let him die. I came to have a heightened respect for the precious fragility of life. And as my career led me into law enforcement, I swore an oath to pursue those who do not share that respect. I take that oath very seriously. And when other officials in public trust violate that oath, it angers me, and I take enormous satisfaction in exposing them. In fact, my current duty assignment includes administration of the Internal Affairs Division, in which we attempt to maintain the integrity of our profession which can never be attained by covering up our mistakes. I am proud of the men and women in this profession, but my philosophy is mess up and you're gone. As the ruins of Mount Carmel still smoldered into the evening hours of April 19th, I received a call from Assistant Special Agent in charge of the Houston Field Division, Mr. Don Carter, who asked if I would be willing to participate in the investigation into the cause of the fire. It was my understanding that ATF's National Response Team would not be used in the investigation because of that agency's involvement in the February 28th raid at the compound. I assume that the request for my assistance was based on the following factors. First, I was at the time the acting director of the Houston Arson Bureau, one of the largest fire investigation agencies in the country, located relatively near Waco, Texas. And secondly, I was known to ATF association with their arson task force in Houston and my experience in similar investigations as a former member of the National Response Team. 
As the chief officer of the Houston Arson Bureau, I had the authority to delegate this assignment to any of more than 50 qualified investigators under my command. I chose to accept the assignment myself for one reason only. I wanted to do it. I met the other members of the fire investigation team as they arrived in Waco, including Mr. John Ricketts, Mr. Bill Cass, Mr. Thomas Hitchings. Prior to this introduction, none of the team members had ever met. I agreed to coordinate the team's activities and was accepted as team leader and spokesman. This decision was made by the team members themselves based primarily on geographics. Texas Ranger Sergeant Lane Aiken was also assigned to, to assist the team. Mr. John Hudek, Mr. John Kaus, and their accelerant detection canine dog responded to the scene from Pennsylvania. By the way, that dog was trained by ATF. We selected Armstrong Forensic Labs in Arlington, Texas to provide laboratory assistance and evidence analysis. I suggested this lab because its proximity to the scene and Dr. Armstrong's specialization in fire debris analysis. Dr. James Quintieri and Fred Maurer from the University of Maryland's Fire Protection Engineering Department were also brought in for consultation and to focus on fire growth rate and development. For the next nine days, we examined, measured, sifted, and photographed the fire scene. The canine was used to locate possible areas containing flammable accelerants. We collected debris samples, documented their location, and submitted them to the laboratory. We viewed photographs of the incident taken as it occurred and obtained videotape from the media and the FBI. Texas Rangers were assigned to conduct interviews with the surviving Davidians and members of the FBI. The Mr. Ray, I hate to interrupt you, but I did not let Mr. Quintero really go to make a statement. I had him making the observations of the technical things of the fire. As much as I understand what you're wanting to tell us, uh, that you did this background work, I know you did, and it will be submitted for the record. Uh, I feel, in, in all fairness, I'm going to have to let Mr. Sherris say about three minutes or four minutes, too. But our objective here, we've just gone five. That's why that yellow light's come on. Uh, in all fairness, we are here to ask questions. We, this is the only panel. I let Mr. Doyle tell a story because we substituted for uh, five or six Davidians who might have been here for a whole panel. And I let Mr. Quintieri do this as an effort to try to get on the record. I don't, I don't want to be rude, but unless you've got something substantively to add to what Mr. Quintieri said about the fire, I would like to restrict it, and, and you can submit that uh, testimony for the record. We just don't have the time. I have something substantive to, to add to these hearings on the record, uh, especially in response to my character being assassinated the other day in these hearings. It was. And that is part of this. That is part of my statement. I, I guess I, I wasn't cut aware part it was. Of it and go to the end if you'd like. If if you, if you would, yeah. If you could just summarize it and go to the end, it would be very helpful. I was not aware your character is being uh, attacked here in these hearings. I, I certainly didn't hear it. But uh, Mr. Perhaps... Chairman, it, it was during the uh, Daguerrean and Mr. Zimmerman when they were questioning. The two attorneys his, questioned it. Yes, the uh, affiliation, I and I think that that's what he was trying to clarify. I think what we can do here is certainly make sure that his full testimony is submitted to for this, but I, I agree that we should give him the opportunity to summarize. Mr. Mr. Please, Chairman. Please go ahead, Mr. Gray, under the circumstances. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Barr. Uh, Parliamentary inquiry, wouldn't that be appropriate if there's a, a member of this panel that wishes to rehabilitate a witness or go into something? They're certainly more than welcome to use their time. Well, I, mean, I really think, I think, go back to what you say, if there's something substantive. We are, going, we are going to have to make it very short. I think Mr. Gray understands that if you can do a couple more minutes and summarize where you are, I will permit it. But Mr. Gray, I just, I can't let everybody who might have been uh, feeling they've been attacked in here present a whole rehabilitation credibility statement. It just, that is not the nature of this hearing. But please proceed to the best. Sir, I, I'm, I'm responding to a letter from Mr. signed by Mr. Zeloff requiring me or asking me to to prepare a statement for delivery in here, and that's what I'm doing. No, we appreciate that's it. That's all I'm asking to do. But your statement is, to, is to, without objection. The whole statement is admitted to the record. We've had a lot of statements submitted for the record in writing. We've given allowed only one or two witnesses for very peculiar purposes to give oral testimony. We've gone directly to questioning, as you, if you've been observing these hearings, know. And uh, and I'm not trying to cut you off, like I said, and be rude, but it just we just have a limited amount of time this afternoon. But please proceed okay. for a couple more minutes. Uh, a newspaper editorial critical of my selection to the investigative team pointed out that, and I quote the editorial, doubts are being fed by criminal defense attorneys, renowned expert at creating doubt, reasonable or otherwise, end quote. I'm sure I'm not the only person who has heard defense attorneys assert that it is not what they believe that is important. Rather, it is what they can convince a jury. After all, that is their agenda. A few days ago in these hearings, you heard dramatic testimony from the same attorney 
who was quoted in another news report as saying, quote, Arson Team Chief Paul Gray may have tainted the investigation due to his apparent ties to the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. In an effort to foster that belief and further discredit me, Mr. Boyer, who's not here right now, of this committee participated in an obviously orchestrated exercise to expose my past affiliation with ATF. I make no apologies for my past law enforcement experiences and have never tried to conceal them. I am proud of the work I did while assigned to the task force, as is evident by having ATF's address, phone number, and insignia on my business card. I am insulted to have to acknowledge these slanderous assaults. However, I can state without reservation, under oath, before God and this body, that I and the members of this investigative team reached our conclusions with complete objectivity, independent of influence from any person or allegiance to any agency or cause. The singular focus of our investigation was to determine the truth. I have endured personal attacks by those who would have the world believe that I was somehow part of a government cover-up in favor of the FBI, the ATF, or this administration. Frankly, I could care less about the reputation of those agencies. And in fact, I didn't even vote for President Clinton. No one needs to try and convince me of the horror of this tragedy. I was there. I was overwhelmed by it. The sights and smells of smoldering human corpses haunt me still. The unrecognizable burnt figures of mothers and mutilated children into grotesque figures of death are still in my nightmares. I felt a sense of indescribable emotional sympathy for these people, and I will never, ever forget it. Most importantly, I could never, ever sleep with a clear conscience or even live with myself if I knowingly misrepresented the truth about what I believe happened in Waco, certainly not to protect the reputation of any government agency or this administration. Finally, I would like to state for the record that this hearing is two years too late. It is most certainly too late for the innocent victims of Oklahoma City who weren't allowed the luxury of a negotiated surrender or any other option and for whom I also grieve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Mr. Sherr, I think in fairness to you, uh, you should be allowed to make a brief statement. I understand you have one. Uh, we would appreciate it if you would make it brief and summarize. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have one uh, prepared, uh, requested be entered in. I uh, will be very without, brief. Without objection. I'll, I'll make a very brief excerpt from that. Uh, there were four good agents killed at Mount Carmel, many wounded, many of whom I knew personally. I resented it when I saw it happen. Since that time, I've met some of the survivors from the fire. I want to make it very clear. I don't take sides. The truth is the only side that, that we need to worry about. I didn't come to these hearings with questions or with answers. I've got a lot of questions. Ever since this thing has happened, the limited resources I've had to examine, I have uh, many, many questions, some of which I'll very briefly summarize. Was Mr. Gray fully aware, or not necessarily Mr. Gray, but the writers of the report, fully aware and informed as to the full extent of the so-called breaching operations? The reason I say this, in there, the word is mentioned to allegedly allow escape from the inside. Uh, I wonder about this use of the word allegedly. Hopefully it's uh, an innocent uh, mistake. Did Mr. Gray or other fire investigators really know exactly what chemical agents and in what amount were actually introduced into the building? We still have quite a bit of controversy on that. Did the authors of the government fire investigation report fully research the properties of those chemicals used at Mount Carmel? And if so, why is the data reflected in their report technically flawed? I'll cite merely two examples. One on the methylene chloride. <laughs> I quote, probably could not have been ignited during deployment and delivery by any common ignition source present in this application. End quote. However, the Dow Chemical Corporation material safety data sheet specifically states that this chemical forms flammable vapor-air mixtures. In addition, the report states, quote, the effectiveness of this product is diminished proportionately to the amount of air available for dissipation, which is why it is intended for enclosed space application, end quote. This statement is in direct contradiction with Dow Chemical Corporation safety data sheet, which specifically states, in confined or poorly ventilated areas, vapors can readily accumulate and cause unconsciousness and death, end quote. 
Do we have actual knowledge of the training of knowledge and training of chemical agent operation procedures involved in this gassing plan? The, another item, the flammable liquid contamination found on items of clothing of certain survivors of the fire were declared to be proof that they had started the fire. I would like to know why key information as to how some of this contamination occurred was omitted from the reports. Specifically, those survivors who ex exited the south side of the building. They had to walk through an area that was contaminated by fuel from large tanks spilled by the government tank operations. We also have the, uh, probably the most important, so I'll just cut to that. There were statements and concerns about could the tanks have crushed containers of fuel, cans of gas, uh, cylinders of propane. In the report, and I quote, if this had happened, an immediate vapor air explosion or flash fire would have occurred involving the vehicle itself. It did not happen, end quote. I must take serious exception to that. As fire investigators know or firefighters know, unless there is a separate flame, a spark, a means of initiation, fuel can be spread, it can be crushed, propane tanks can be run over and they will leak, but they will not explode or burn. This is not speculation. I took an armored military track vehicle and ran over samples of every every flammable liquid and gas known to be at Mount Carmel and reported in the fire report. There's no fire. There's no explosion. I would like to submit this copy of the videotape. Without objection. There are also uh, still photographs. I wasn't aware at the time I was called to these hearings of the material that could be presented. So what I have is not as much as I would hope for it to be, but uh, I'll be glad to answer any possible questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheriff. Uh, Mr. Hyde, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to yield my time to uh, Mr. Schiff. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Gray, I just want to begin by saying that I agree with you um, that possible association you may have had with uh, ATF does not taint your testimony in my mind as a professional. But I also want to say that anyone's association with other organizations, including the National Rifle Association, does not necessarily taint their testimony either, but that's been a favorite character assassination that's been used all during these hearings. I accept witnesses at face value as professionals and as witnesses. And I further want to say I see my role as asking questions to bring out testimony and, and, and evidence for conclusions to be reached later. And for that reason, uh, Mr. Quintieri, I'd like to come back to you a little bit, please, sir. When asked by Mr. Schumer about the possibility that this fire could have started in three separate locations by lanterns overturning at the same time, Mr. Schumer uh, asserted, and I believe you agreed, well, that would take quite a coincidence to happen. Um, you stated uh, fire is very rare, uh, and therefore adding to the idea that that would... rare event, yes. Right. Uh, and uh, adding to the idea that that would be a tremendous coincidence for lanterns to be turned over simultaneously in three different places, right? Uh, you have to answer yes. out loud. Recorders yes. can't take nods yes. very easily. I'm sorry. Well, I have to ask you this question. How common is it for the United States government to send armored vehicles uh, to buildings inhabited by uh, our men, women, and children and to be uh, pouring tear gas into them? Uh, how often does that occur? I can only answer that question on based on what we see in the news media. And how many times I can't have you answer that question as an expert in, how many times in military have you seen affairs. It? How many times have you seen it in the news media? Rarely seen it in the news media. Rarely? You've seen it more than once? I can't recall any. My point is, I'm trying, I'm trying to picture what it was like inside this compound when, when armored vehicles are advancing first from one place but very quickly thereafter uh, in several places. Uh, and, and maybe they came about because there was uh, a fire from the building. I don't mean flame fire, I mean shooting fire. But there are a number of people inside that building who, had, who would have panicked, wouldn't they? Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that would happen? That's not a, I guess, arson-related question. It's a human question. Wouldn't you think that might have been going on inside that structure? 
Again, I think panic is a psychological term, and I'm not sure I can really uh, re describe panic to you in, in, in that sense. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Shero, if I may turn to you. Um, you testified you retired from the United States Army but did serve with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I would like to ask, were you serving with the Bureau uh, in February of 1993 or, or right about then? No, sir, I was not. So you... you during, during what period of time did you serve with the Bureau? I was on uh, leave, uh, administrative leave at that uh, time period in 1993. All right. So you had no part in the, in, in, in the preparation or anything having to do with this raid? No, sir, not at all. Did you, did you have the opportunity to review it either, or have you reviewed it just uh, from news reports uh, uh, and, and from, or from official reports or from both? Yes, sir, I've uh, had a chance to review both and uh, also talk to people that were there uh, Branch Davidians and ATF agents as well. Well, let me ask you, as a former uh, professional with the Bureau, uh, what's your opinion of the plan and execution of the raid back on February 28, 1993? If you have, if you formed an opinion. Unfortunately, I uh, predicted something like this was going to happen two and a half years before Waco. Now, now what? Of, of what I saw uh, going on uh, within the Bureau. What did you see within the Bureau that caused you to predict that this would happen two and a half years before Waco? The uh, mindset, first let me say, uh, the people in the, in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, they're some of the best agents in the world. There are, unfortunately, some bad apples, as we see in every organization. These have tarnished the badges of the good guys. I'd like to see that tarnish taken off. I saw recruiting of personnel uh, going to younger kids, who had a mindset. Uh, there was a very anti-gun mode inside. Unfortunately, there's a lot of ATF agents that are NRA members. So they're, they're not all anti-gun, but there are some, and the attitude was moving up toward the top. And not just ATF, we see it in law enforcement agencies down to street level, uh, city police departments now. And we heard testimony the other day about there will be no knock search warrants in the future. They're gearing up. We're seeing more battle gear, if you will. We're seeing a mindset on the side of law enforcement. It's a, a dangerous a job. Mindset, a mindset to do what? That the bad guys are, are winning, which is we've got to attack the bad guys. We've got to use bigger guns, bigger uh, armored vehicles now, more and more. And unfortunately, we're seeing citizens, uh, most of them are the bad guys, but a lot of them that aren't are fighting back. They figure no matter what they do, they're going to get hurt. Whether they're bad guys or not, and I'll finish with this question, do you, did you see a mindset developing towards the idea of military-style operations as a preferential way to go? Yes, sir, I have uh, with the armament, uh, with the equipment, and with the tactics and the training. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, I believe, are you ready? Are you next? I'm told you are. Mr. Taylor, or who's, who's taking time down here? You want to pass your entire side over here? Uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Coble, are you ready to take some time? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will extend Mr. the gentleman from New Mexico's remarks in that I, I was not there, and I'm not an expert in firefighting, gentlemen, but I, I don't know that it would be all that coincidental for liners to be knocked down given the environment at that time. Mr. Doyle, let me ask you a question. You referred, and gentlemen, I only have five minutes, so if you all can be brief, I will be appreciative. Mr. Doyle, you referred to wet towels. Did you have a supply of wet towels there? I'm just uh, commenting on what I heard was the way that the children and the women were found after the fire. So, so, so you wrapped didn't... Wrapped in blankets and wet towels. You never saw any wet towels? No. So you... Well, do you know with certainty, I guess what I'm getting around to is how were they, how were they moistened? With water? Right. Because, because you I had understand. mentioned earlier about the, there being an obvious scarcity of water. What was the source of the water? Rainwater was the only source we had. So it would have been soaked with the rainwater that you'd saved up, I guess. Apparently, yes. Uh, no one, I don't think, has mentioned the possibility of the of the cause of the fire as being from gunfire, either 
guns fired from inside Mount Carmel or guns fired from outside the, the compound. Could that, Mr. Sharon or the others, could that have ignited uh, the fire? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, go back to what I had said in the test that had been done on the armored vehicle crushing fuel tanks. Uh, we used one gallon cans in that test. Uh, just for samples, and out of one gallon, the fuel would spurt up to 20 feet, which would, could cover a, a quite a bit of area, especially if multiple cans or larger cans were hit. Gunfire could very well set off uh, fuels such as gasoline. Uh, lanterns, uh, the building, from what I've, it's been described to me personally, people thought they were in an earthquake. The building was shaking, uh, it was falling apart. And we've seen in earthquakes, people aren't running around setting intentional fires. I'm not saying it was not intentionally set. I'm saying I still have a lot of study to do. Well, it would seem to me that it would not be unlikely that gunfire could ignite the flames. Gentlemen, you all want to be heard on that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we don't have any more studying to do. We've done our studying, and this fire did not happen as a result of gunfire. Certainly, uh, what Mr. Sherrill here says can happen. It doesn't take a fire expert uh, to be able to, to know that you can run over a gasoline can and spill the gasoline on the ground and it not ignite. Mr. Quindere, do you want to be heard? I think that the projectile from the gun, I mean, I'm not familiar with any experiments along those lines, but if the projectile from the gun, is, gun was hot, you would have seen it on the infrared. You don't see any kind of traces like that. Now, certainly if a projectile punctures a can of gasoline, when it's puncturing it, then there's going to be some heat due to that puncture, and that could ignite the gasoline. Let me revert to Mr. Doyle and extend the gentleman from New Mexico's questioning concerning the possibility of, of lanterns. Mr. Doyle, did you observe or do you have any knowledge about lanterns being accidentally or intentionally knocked over that could have started the fire during your time within the compound? There were um, lanterns in use. I observed no lanterns knocked over on the 19th, and nor did I hear any gunfire coming from within uh, Mount Carmel throughout that morning. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Mr. Quintero, it has been said that, that some of the people inside Mount Carmel died by their own hand, self-inflicted gunshots. Did, that, did those shots, were they revealed on the flare that you were observing? No, that would be within the, you know, the building, and you would have to have been able to see through the roof of the building. The flare is not capable of that. If anything came from outside the building in that was hot, it should have been visible on the flare. Mr. Chairman, if anyone wants, uh, my time's about out, but I think uh, I'll yield to the gentleman from me. I'd be glad to take it. Well, the gentleman from well, Tennessee. Mr. Bryant can have it. Got, That's fine. The gentleman from Tennessee got me first. Mr. Bryant. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Very quickly to our two experts on this left end, uh, the more traditional ways of investigating arsons uh, were they employed in terms of were there tests run to see if there were, were in fact accelerants, gasoline found within the uh, charred runs of this uh, area, and uh, were burn patterns, was there enough left there to determine burn patterns and things like that? Yes, there were uh, tests run. What were the results? Uh, the results, uh, we collected over a hundred samples of debris, um, basically just fire debris, and had them submitted to Dr. Armstrong's lab, and uh, he did analyze them, and he reported back to us his findings, and he did confirm that there was uh, gasoline, kerosene, um, Coleman fuel, and some other accelerants present in the compound. You mentioned burn patterns, and I said in my statement that the, the, th this building was essentially level, so you really could not look for signatures like that. But let me add something. Uh, burn patterns are uh, cited by fire investigators. And recently there has been a study done, and I have some informal results from that study, to actually look at whether burn patterns are meaningful in any way or can be interpreted the way people think. And the conclusion is that they cannot. So one cannot just look for burn patterns. This was one of the reasons we were asked to look into this fire, as well as the group under Paul Gray. And that is to bring the science of fire and what has been learned through fire research into this 
element of fire investigation so we can make observations and interpret them based on the physics of how fire would behave and then draw conclusions from that. And I think that, that, is, that, is, that is a more important aspect. And, I, and, if, and if you allow, I think Paul Gray said maybe something like this should have been done following such a fire. When there is a national incident of such prominence and it is a fire, I feel that in order to learn something from that, the resources of the country should be put into understanding what took place. Because fire is rare, we had an event in the World Trade Center where a bomb went off. If that bomb had caused a bigger fire, people in that building would have been threatened and we would have had a catastrophe, more than what took place. So we should learn from these events and we should use the element of science to bring it in, bring in not only into fire safety in general, but into the area of fire investigation. This is what we tried to do and the role that we played. Mr. Brian, Mr. Cobalt's time and yours have expired. Uh, Ms. Slaughter, you're recognized for five minutes. <coughs> Chiro, did you discuss your uh, parents here today with anyone from the NRA? Were you contacted by them or have you discussed it with them? No, ma'am, no, no one whatsoever. When you commented that the good guys were starting to fight back, to whom are you referring? No, I was uh, the average citizen. The, the militia movement? Uh, not necessarily militia. I've, ta I've talked to university professors, uh, doctors, grandmothers. They're, they're starting to wonder what's happening to the country. Uh, the government's not being honest with them on a lot of things. They're searching for the truth. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they're getting a lot of garbage, and that's the only word I can use, uh, Do you about flame-throwing tanks and yourself, conspiracies, and I don't believe this. Ma'am? Is that your, that is your feeling, that the government is involved in a conspiracy here? I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I don't like them. I think they're ridiculous. Uh, there are some things that the government needs to be more honest and open with the public on, but I'm sure that's going to happen. Mr. Doyle, I first want to acknowledge your great pain and realize that you lost your daughter, but I'd really like to understand a little bit more about living inside that compound. How long have you been there? <clears throat> I first went to Mount Carmel in 1966. Were you, are you married? I were was. You, you were married. Uh, was your wife with you at the compound? Uh, no, I've been divorced since 1976. But your daughter did go with the you. Yeah, daughter was there. Yes. And your daughter was one of Koresh's wives. She has never ad admitted that. Uh, we were very close, and she has never mentioned a word of that to me. You. Uh, you know, that accusation has been made, but I, you know, I'm not in a position to confirm or deny it. Well, and then I. I'm happy to give an opportunity for you to deny that, if that's well, what you believe. You know, I don't believe that, but I'll, I'll Mr. Doyle, you said that, that you were told you couldn't come out en masse. Who told you that? That was the information we were given early in the By scene. whom? Probably Steve Schneider, since David was pretty well incapacitated for the first three weeks or so. So it was someone within the branch of that told you that? Yeah, there were people coming down from upstairs uh, conveying messages and so on. It may have been Steve, I'm not real sure. Um, and you were also told that if you came out, you could expect to be shot and killed? The way it was explained to me was that the, the sniper nest or the perimeter uh, agents that were around the perimeter and needed to be informed that individuals were coming out and they needed to be described to them, you know, their sex, their age, or how many and so on. That was the understanding I was given. When you lived at the compound, Mr. Doyle, were you free to come and go as you pleased? Yes. You could go anywhere you like? Yes, I could. Did you have to check in or out with anyone at all? Not really, no. And throughout the whole time that you were there, uh, were you aware of people being held there against their will? People were not held against their will. Uh, are when, uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of You people. mentioned there were a lot of places that were off limits, so right. there were rules that you had to go by, but you, right. could, you could leave any time you wanted. That's correct, and people it, did. Is it your feeling that any time during the 51 days that you could have walked out that door? Yes. But what do you think would have awaited you? Well, in my case, <clears throat> as I said, I was told at one point uh, by the negotiators the only time I ever talked to them on the phone. They asked, they didn't say you're under arrest, come on out, you know. Uh, they asked me when I was coming out, as far as I can remember the wording. And uh, 
I says, well, why do I need to come out? I have not committed a crime. This is my home. This is where I live. And they says, well, you know, we have to get things, you know, settled. Uh, we need to talk with people and so on. And I says, well, where will I go if I come out? And they says, well, you have a daughter in California, don't you? And I says, yes, that's correct. They says, well, you can go live with her. And uh, as I said, what we saw of those that did come out were they were being sent um, to jail, the adults, even elderly women in their 70s were being uh, actually indicted for murder or, or charged. This was a, in the early... told that that's what happened when people came out. We, we saw it and heard it on the news. I see. Um, Mr. Doyle, did uh, David Koresh, you mentioned that he thought he was going to die. Is that yes, correct? that's true. What was his reaction when he thought he was going to die? How did he I feel think... about it? What did he say to his followers? Um, let's see. I think he was kind of scared in some respects, but uh, from what I understand, he made a phone call to his mother and left a message on her answering machine. She wasn't there. That he was And he said he die. would see her, you know, when he returned. We, we believe in a resurrection, and so it's... That, uh, so Mr. Koresh, like all human beings at that point, was really afraid to die. Is that, would that be a correct statement? Uh, to some extent, yes. Do I understand, Mr. Doyle, that at this moment you still believe Mr. Koresh was the Lamb of God and that he is coming back on a day certain, bringing all the people who died with him? We believe in a, a resurrection at which but all I, I want to know about Koresh, though. Right, he will be included, yes. And you believe that throughout your time with him that what he told you was the truth? Sure, I do. That's you don't I... feel in any way that you were used by him or no. made to, to stay or be a part of that organization, you felt absolutely no. free to come and go any time. Yes, I did. Was there, do you know of any other religion that requires men to give up their wives and daughters? I've heard of some, but I couldn't name them. Are you, are you still an Australian citizen or are you no, an American? No, I'm not. I'm an American citizen. Uh, I, it, was, were you a part of a religion like this in Australia? I was a member of the Davidian and the Branch Davidian churches in Australia before coming here, yes. You were brought into that by David Koresh's no, visit no, to no. Australia? No. I, I became a Davidian and a Branch Davidian long before David Koresh ever. You were with the lived. rodents? Right. The, the All right. Your time uh, has, yes, I'm sorry. I have, I have taken advantage of your good feeling. Thank you. Mr. Bryant, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'll yield my entire time to the chairman. Well, I thank you for yielding, and, and I will yield half my time, two and a half, the time you've yielded, two and a half minutes to Mr. Zell. Uh, Mr. Doyle, uh, do you know Brad Branch? Yes, I do. Um, I talked to him yesterday, an interesting conversation. Where were you on 228 when the ATF tried to deliver the search warrant? I was in, in my room, you were which in your was room. the third window from the left on the front of the building. He tells me he was with David at the door. Is that correct, you know? Or? That's his story. I never saw him. Yeah. He, he also told me that, that uh, the ATF, uh, there was a female agent that shot the dog at, from behind as they were delivering the search warrant at the door. Uh, that's where the first shot, the shot was the dog, and then a response possibly erupted from them. Do you think that's correct? Uh, that's possible. During our trial, there was quite a number of agents claiming that they shot at the dogs. And five dogs ended up being killed. And, and that may have erupted in, in firepower If, in if the first shot was actually at the dog, I, it could have been misinterpreted or whatever. I don't... But Particularly from people that may have not seen... From my seen personal experience, the first shots I heard were from outside coming toward the building. Let me, let me ask you this. Do I still have a little bit? Um, you, you, you heard the testimony on the fire, and, but you were there. Um, what do you think, what were your observations uh, relative to the, I mean, I, I saw it on TV, I saw the tanks go in, I saw us go through the buildings, come back, I heard the announcement, this is not an attack, um, you know, and the tank would go back in and go right through the building. Uh, what did you feel? What were your emotions? Well, we definitely weren't believing what we were hearing over the loudspeakers, that they were not entering the building or this was not an attack. Uh, you know, we were told they weren't going to be shooting, and yet they're firing 
what amounted to mortars or, or rockets at us, uh, these ferret rounds, which sounded like a, a mortar. Were you, you afraid? Sh yes. What were, about the kids? I mean, was this a safe place for kids to be in? I think that's why the, the women ended up putting them in the cement building, because they felt they were protected. I'll, I'll yield my uh, time back to the chairman. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Zello. Mr. Quintieri, when did that first fire start? What time? Precisely? Yes, sir. Let, yeah, I think it's 12.07.42. I'll just refer to my... That, that's as early as you got on the flare. I mean, yes. that would have been the earliest time for fire starting there's any yes. documentation on. Yes. I just want the record to reflect that in examining the transcript Mr. Schumer was referring to when the quote at the end was, let's keep that fire going, the time listed here was 1148. That would be inconsistent with, with what we saw on with the what you saw on the tape. That's right. I also would like to ask you a question about the other comments. That apparently there was fuel being poured or spread at 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. Would fuel, I don't know what the fuel was, but it might have been kerosene for lanterns, who knows, but would normal fuel we think of, uh, fuel oil or kerosene or whatever, wouldn't it evaporate, uh, or would yes, it have evaporated it would, by noon? It would begin to evaporate, but if it's saturating into the wood floor, it could still be ignited later. Uh, if it's something like gasoline, it's going to evaporate much more rapidly than kerosene, and it's going to be much easier to ignite than kerosene. Well, there's some pretty, uh, I guess you could say, damaging statements here with regard around 723 about questions about is there a way to spread the fuel in there and some hay and this sort of stuff. Uh, but there is a question mark in my mind about whether the fuel being poured earlier might not have been just simply pouring it into these lanterns. We don't know, obviously. We don't, we don't know. And, and what I might add is that when one says that a fire is, appears to be intentionally accelerated, it could have been done based on using flammable liquids. It could also have been done based on the way the normal fuel load might be arranged. The way you stack chairs, if there were, ba there were bales of hay, the way that was arranged, those things could have added to the rapid spread. You're not of aware of there being any hay in there, though, other than... Yes, I, I did see bales was, of hay. There was yes. hay in there. All right. yes. Mr. Sherrill, you heard earlier a, writ, a, a litany of, of reasons of possible ways that fire could have been started in there. We got one added by Mr. Schiff about the gunfire. Uh, but, you know, from all kinds of listings, Mr. Schumer read off. Uh, and Mr. Quintieri responded to each one of those uh, in the negative, that none of those were possible. In your statement, it seemed to me you were in an effort in part contradicting that, but I'd like for you to run through with me if you agree, if you don't, or if you disagree with the different possible methods of starting that fire that were ruled out by Mr. Quintieri. Can you do that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the first one is the flamethrowing tank absolutely did not happen. Uh, the flame on one of those, to set the record straight, it was a 180 to 200 meter rod would have blown right through the building. So that didn't uh, happen. That, that did not happen, no sir. Uh, the lanterns being knocked over, uh, there is a possibility. However, we'd have to have fuel leaking ahead of time, which could be attributed. They could be in areas crushed by the vehicles uh, during the assault on the building, especially in the the rear area of the building. Uh, a lot of damage was done. There's a lot of things that could happen. Uh, the thing that really concerns me is why the building was so totally destroyed afterwards, after the fire was, was out. There was no firefighting whatsoever attempted, and then the crime scene, and it was a crime scene, was totally, absolutely destroyed. And I've seen this happen before. Well, I understand that, but my point, and I don't want to take a time right. asking a question, though, is that you did not dispute the, generally speaking, the answers Mr. Quintieri gave. You, you would have ruled out those things that he ruled out in Mr. Schumer's response. Yes, sir. All right, that's just what I wanted to know, because I didn't want to leave something hanging, because your, your statement was somewhat critical, comparatively speaking, and I wanted to find out. Uh, at this time, let's see, Mr. Watt, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield one minute to Ms. Slaughter and four minutes to Mr. Scott. I thank you very much for yielding. Mr. Doyle, I, I wanted to make one other comment. Uh, the forensic laboratory findings showed that on your shoes was substance identified as camp stove oil, which would indicate that you had walked across it on your way to the hole from which you escaped. Correct? Well, after How we came out of the How would you account for that being there? The fuel oil was not in the area of the building, inside the building. It was when we came out, they had tipped over our diesel and gasoline supplies that we had 
Uh, we had four large tanks on pedestals, which are obvious in the... Mr. Doyle, could it be possible that the, the that the fire that you saw that covered the hole that you came out of immediately after your departure have been uh, raging there because there was camp uh, stove oil, fuel on that floor? Is it possible? I don't believe, not in the area where we came out, no. You were not aware of any fuel of any sort? There being, had been... <clears throat> a lot of the women would bring their lanterns into the chapel during no, the I'm, I'm talking about... But not in the area we ex exited from, no. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doyle, were you tried for any... Uh, were you one of the defendants in the trial? Yes, I was. I spent 10 months in jail and went through the San Antonio trial and was exonerated on all points. Okay. During the trial, did any defendants... Was, was it a joint trial? Everybody right, tried together? there was 11 defendants. Did any of the defendants stipulate that the fires started, were started by people inside the compound? Not that I know of, no. They were trying to, from what I understand, say that I was the one that lit it because my hands were burnt. But that, those charges were withdrawn uh, during the trial because of lack of evidence and so on. I think they were, they were building this point up because of the shoe, the dog, hitting on the shoes and so on. Well, you, have, you have no knowledge of any defense attorneys stipulating that the Davidians started the fires? I've heard since the trial that there were uh, defense lawyers that are making that claim in, in, in the press. What about during the trial? You're not aware of it during the trial? I don't remember it okay. coming out in the trial. And no Davidi did any Davidians mention or admit during the trial that they had set the fires? No. Not to your knowledge? No. No or not to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge did any of the defendants admit. Mr. Gray, can you comment uh, about the flammability of CS gas again? I mean, I think we went... You're, I think you said that it was not flammable, is that right? It's that it did not contribute to the, to the fire? We Mr. Determined Quintary, how do, you spell, how do you spell your last name? Because we have two, two different spellings. Q-U-I-N-T-I-E-R-E. Okay. Uh, can you, can one of you or both comment on the flammability of CS uh, gas, whether it contributed to the... Dr. Quintieri will... All right. Whether it contributed that. to the fire or not. It, in my opinion, it did not contribute to the fire based on the fact that as an airborne flammable vapor, it did not evidently reach a concentration for the methylene chloride that would have caused the fire propagation through this compound we did not see any such behavior that would be indicative of a flammable vapor. In other words, like a, a natural gas leak in a building. Nothing like that was seen. Secondly, if this methylene chloride or CS deposits on objects that will later burn, is there a question as to whether they would enhance the fire spread over these objects, make them ignite easier, all right? In my conclusions, the answer to that also is no, and it's based on the data in the literature and experiments I did just recently to make that point more definitive. And what were the results of your experiment? That the methylene chloride did not have any enhancement effect on the fire propagation in this fire. And in addition, in one of the experiments, the methylene chloride actually put out a candle flame that was adjacent to, to a dish of methylene chloride. The vapors actually put out the candle flame. Thank so it you. could actually act as an inhibitor under some circumstances. And the remainder of the time, Mr. Gray, I think you were cut off in your statement. Did, did you not have time to um, uh, finish your, uh, were the things you wanted to say, didn't have time to say it? Well, I kind of, <clears throat> I omitted a part of it, but uh, just for your information, uh, to clarify something important about fire. In any fire investigation, there are a limited number of conclusions that can be drawn. Fire either occurs as a natural phenomenon, as a result of an accident, or intentional human conduct. When there's insufficient evidence to support a definitive conclusion, we have no problem <clears throat> leaving it undetermined. And that's what we will do if we don't know. Uh, when there is no reasonable doubt, however, as to the origin and cause of a fire, as in this case, a clear conclusion may be drawn without reservation. And that's what we did in this case. Um, to, to further get back to um, something that Mr. Sherrill had said earlier in, in response to a question about 
the different ways this fire could have occurred and the, some of the questions that he had. Um, we are not saying and never did say that you can't cause a fire by kicking over a lantern, like Mrs. O'Leary's cow theory. Uh, certainly that can happen. What we had to do is take all of these theories, like a bullet striking a flammable liquid, uh, like a lantern being tumped over, and all these other theories, and we had to apply them, not in general terms, but we had to apply them to this specific case under what we know happened by the, the uh, primarily and admittedly, the photographic evidence helped us more than anything, I think, in this investigation. So when we took our, for instance, our samples, our debris samples, we compared those samples taken and identified in the areas where we saw fire in the photographs and in enhanced and improved or corroborated, I should say, by the infrared. Um, the, the thought of a, of a tank running over, uh, the report responds to a, an allegation that a, uh, in, in fact, it was another one of those unfounded conspiracy seeds laid by Jack Zimmerman that said, originally that uh, the tank had uh, run over a propane cylinder and caused the fire, and that's what started the fire. Uh, what we were responding to was the fact that propane is a liquefied petroleum gas. And when exposed to atmosphere, when open to atmosphere, it evaporates very rapidly. Um, what, what we meant in our report is that had a tank run over a propane cylinder exposing a gas like that, we most probably would have had a fireball right then and there, because propane, if not ignited early in a 25 mile an hour wind, and Dr. Quinterio will agree with me, it dissipates very rapidly. It doesn't leave, leave a pool uh, to just sit there for a while. The other thing was um, uh, the, the flammable liquid containers, the gasoline cans, the Coleman fuel cans, and I think I saw some photographs, some big pictures that we could show if somebody has them somewhere. Um, uh, there are those cans, very important, they were found in the debris. If you close a cylinder, um, uh, excuse me, a container, if you fill a container with gasoline or water for that matter, and you seal the top of it, and you set it in a room and you set that room on fire, there will be an increase in pressure in the inside of that can due to the, due to the liquid trying to expand and trying to convert into a vapor. As that occurs, that container begins to swell until it just basically gives up. It will break and it'll rupture, spilling its contents. After the fire's out, we will find that can, and it will show evidence of internal heat, rupture, pressure, and it will be evident that that can was closed and sealed up at the time of the fire. However, in this case, we found about two dozen flammable liquid containers with the tops removed, not not blown up, but removed. We also found some of these containers, and there is a photograph, I saw it just this morning, um, of holes punched in the side of these containers. Not, not that they were flattened. And we did find, by the way, we did find a couple of containers that were actually smashed. And they could have admittedly been smashed by a tank. And they were back there in the gymnasium area, the last place to catch on fire, I should, I should add. Um, we did find some flattened containers. We did find the containers that were not flattened and they were not overpressured and ruptured. They were opened and they were, had holes punched in them similar to and consistent with a knife blade. And finally, the explosion, the big explosion. The question was asked of Mr. Quinteria earlier about had he heard of any other theories. Yes, I've heard of another theory. In fact, uh, as part of the, the lawsuit against the government, uh, I read uh, a part of an affidavit submitted that said uh, that the FBI on foot entered the building, shot the Davidians, and planted an explosive device on top of the church vault that he called it. We referred to it as the bunker because it's a uh, concrete cinder block. Um, that's another theory that did not, could not have possibly happened uh, in this, this particular incident, referring to that explosion. The explosion happened well after the building was totally destroyed. Um, it, was, it was very unlikely that, uh, that that explosion was anything other than a propane cylinder. As Dr. Quinteri pointed out, he did, this guy's a wizard with the math. Uh, I, I asked him many times, I probably bored him to death, but I asked him a lot of real dumb questions and I asked him very plainly and simply, 
Doc, is it possible for this to happen? And he would give me a mathematical formula and show me that there is no way. That cylinder of propane we found in the courtyard. There is a small courtyard um, that is next to the, the uh, center part of the building in a little alcove. There was, in fact, a 100-pound uh, propane cylinder with a piece of the top blown out about the size of a football, exactly where that explosion occurred. And I have no doubt that that is what the big explosion is, and it was certainly not an incendiary device, nor was it a bomb that the Davidians had planted in there. Thank you very much. Uh, your time has expired, Mr. Shattuck. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, I'd like to thank the members of this panel. I think it's been very helpful testimony. Mr. Quintieri, uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity to explain one issue that's uh, been, that I think you had to rush over in your testimony, it is the flash in the window. There's this long dog run, if you recall, that's on the top of the gymnasium. It runs the opposite direction. And there's a window, one single window, at the, long, at the end of that long, what they call the dog run. And as the camera was going by, the infrared camera, there's a flash of heat in that window. And I think you said, yeah, if you can show the, show the dog run, there we go. That's the dog run, that window. And you said there was a momentary or an, an incident that wasn't repeated. Can you explain why that's not a fire again for us? Okay. Uh, I didn't discern that it was in the window. I thought it was more in the debris pile in that location. Well, okay. So I, if, that, if that's what we're talking about, it was a momentary flash. Uh, it's uh, indicative of sunlight reflecting off something and registering on the flare. It could be a thermal pattern. If it were a thermal pattern, there is nothing that persists from that. Right. So therefore, it is more likely to have been reflected light off of something shiny in which the sunlight now gives an apparent temperature rise. And, and the, if, if you don't, and, help, if you don't excuse mind me, me help to clarify me. that for you. If the, I just want to ask you, the flare, if it were, I saw it and it looked to me like it came off the window. Okay. Um, if the, the flare would pick up a flash off the window, is that what you're saying? some kind of reflection. I was told that some of these windows were boarded over and some of them had aluminum foil on it. So if it were aluminum foil caught at the right angle with the sunlight, you would see that. We're going to see it again, I think, in a minute because we're going to show some of the FLIR tape. It is just a quick flash. I agree with you. I just wanted to understand what that was. If it's the sun flashing off, so be it. Um, Mr. Chairman, the next point I want to make is that uh, during my questioning, really, of Mr. Potts and Mr. Hubble, um, I went into some issues. Uh, they dealt with uh, the FLIR tapes, the FBI tapes that were taken. I understand we're going to show those in a moment uh, so that we can see what they showed. But though I had not asked Mr. Clark a question, he became quite angry um, over uh, some of my questioning and demanded to know if we had, we here on the panel, had this report. Uh, it turns out, and I've checked with staff on both sides, and I just, for the record, would like it to reflect, um, First of all, talking with staff, both for the Judiciary Committee and for the Government Operations Subcommittee, um, neither, none of our staff indicate that we had this report. We absolutely did not have this report in this form. Uh, I understand a discussion went back and forth between the Justice Department officials who are here uh, and our staff, and they say, well, you had it. Uh, we did hold up uh, what appeared to be this document, and Mr. Clark said it was flat not that document. It is indeed not that document. Um, the only thing that the Justice Department Department now says is that it may have been in stacks of paper like this that we received. I never saw it, and it wasn't given to us, and it was not identified to us in any way as the April 12th uh, briefing paper for the Attorney General. Mr. Clark is not with the Attorney General's office now, nor with the FBI, so perhaps he did not know that we did not have it or that we did not have it in that form. I certainly was unaware of it. Um, it is, I understand, the report that the footnote on page 272 of the Department of Justice's report says that the Attorney General herself did not read carefully, uh, nor did she read the supporting documentation for it. With that, uh, I'd like, I understand we're going to show the videotape that is the FLIR tape, uh, which shows these incidents leading up to the fire. <coughs> Anything of that nature that Mr. Shattuck would like. Uh, I don't know how, how lengthy this uh, tape might be. This at, at points, Mr. Chairman, it may be worthy to speed the tape up so that we don't. Well, waste you, you a direct lot of time. that, whatever you want. Uh, here. 
if you can see the tape, and, and uh, Mr. Quintieri, maybe you could point things out. Could you point out that tank with your little indicator, your green indicator? You see the tape, the tank now going into the back of the building. This is the gym. The perpendicular line at the top is what they call the dog run with the window. Maybe you, there's the first entry of the tank. There are a series of these. If you have the ability, as I understand you do, to show double time, maybe when the tank is way away from the building, you could speed the tape up so that we can see uh, principally its entries. OK, that is double time. There we go. This is uh, a second entry. Mr. Quintieri, would the, would the bright light at the back of the tank be the exhaust of the tank? Uh, that's the engine, I think. It's the heated back part of the tank. Thank you. It might be possible to see the exhaust as well. Mr. Quintieri, if you could pull the microphone up close. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I would allow Mr. Shadid to explore this with you for a little bit when the light runs out. So that's part of his question to get this tape clarified. As you see now, the tank is approaching again. It's still at the right edge of that roof, going at the corner. The, Mr. Quintier, do you know where the bunker is? Can you show that with? The bunker is back there. There's yet another entry by the tank. And at some point, the tank disappears into the building. I'm not sure which entry it is. There was a plume of heat, it looked like it came out the back of the building at that point. Again, that white light coming out back out is the engine at the back of the tank. Maybe That's point, correct. That maybe would be my point, interpretation. Maybe you can point out the white that I'm referring to with the, thank you, sir. This is the point at which the tank again disappears for some time into the interior of the building. This continue on for quite a while, Mr. Shattuck? It does. If this is double time, maybe we can speed it up. Ultimately, there comes a point where the right corner of the roof collapses onto the tank. There we go. Okay. Now you can see, so if you could stop it right there, you can see where now the roof has collapsed with these multiple entries. Um, if you could take the green and show the dog run, and then show that shadow, there's the dog run. And then below it is a shadow showing where that whole section of roof has collapsed away. And now if you can show the tank, I think this is the point at which the tank begins to go up onto the roof. Right there. OK, if you proceed. And maybe uh, this is double time. OK. As you can see at that point, there's a, the tank is now going up on the left half of that roof. It's already gone up on the right half.
Do we know what uh, time this was? Ms. Yes, I believe we do. It shows it's a, I believe it's right around 12 o'clock, 12. 11.31. 11.31. So it's a half an hour or so before the fire began. Is that correct, Mr. Quinter? That's correct. <laughs> and in a part of building where the fire didn't in fact start. Except for that force, fourth uh, incident that we saw on the video. I think my point of my question earlier was not that the fire in fact started here, but that it could have started here once you started destroying a part of a building. That that kind of destruction could have led to the start of a fire, whether it did or did not. Certainly it could, but it didn't. We're, we're evaluating what's the risk. What changes do we need to make? Did we take excessive risk? That's the issue. Frankly, any time you run into a, a, a frame construction building like that with a tank, you run a risk of burning it down. As you can see now, if, if you would, Mr. Quintieri, show that now the right half of that roof has been destroyed. And, and I believe just a few more frames here, the left half of the roof is, in fact, destroyed itself. And that's the rubble we later see consumed in fire. That's correct. Mr. Shattuck, how much more of this tape do we need? I'm not trying I, to We're just about finished, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've now destroyed the right half of the roof uh, completely. We take a couple more runs and destroy the left half of the roof. Uh, and, and essentially, I think the tank backs out. If you can see the ridge line, um, Mr. Quintier, you maybe you can point out that ridge line. You'll see that in a few frames and in the still frames we have up, the it was destroyed all the way up to the ridge line. This is what you're talking about? Well, I'm talking about the ridge line going the other way. This? And uh, the next one further down, right this? there. All the way from the left, from the green arrow to the left, that roof becomes destroyed along that ridge line. Go ahead. What, can you tell us, can you read for us the time now? It's now 11.43, and we're running at double speed. Thank you. Keep running it. It's after 12 o'clock. I think what you're looking for is that flare. It's after 12 o'clock. Is the flare after 12 o'clock? Yes, it is. And is a tank present at that time? Um, it's in the area. There's a tank. In yeah. It was in your. It was in the video which you showed, yes. right, Mr. Quintieri? Yeah. If you, if you allow me, if you run it to 12:08, that's about the time that that. Once you show up about, say 12:06, and 12 at that point we'll yeah. be able to see. At this point, as I said, it's difficult to count the number of entries of the tank, but the point's made, I believe. We're running ahead to 12.08. Fast forward, to... sure enough now. Okay, that's fair enough. We're, we're trying to save your time and everybody well, else's we time, want Mr. To. Chairman. Thank you. We're, at the, we're on uh, Mr. Shattig's time. Of, uh, well, actually, Mr. Quintieri is theoretically answering this question, which we're getting to at 12.08 as soon as this tape gets there, and it'll all be over. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, with all due respect, if... Mr. Conyers' time went against my five minutes and was measured to the what are we now? megasecond. We're at 12.04 at this second. time, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And, and if we might, Mr. Quinnier, if, if you could show that, that we're now, it's now destroyed to the roof line. Mr. Chairman, that's fine. I, I really have nothing further. Mr. Quinnier has explained the flash. If he wants to show it on his tape or his tape, that's fine. But he, I wanted to give him an opportunity to explain that flash in the window. I did see it. People have raised it with me, I think. People need to understand, it. if it's a reflection of light, it's a reflection of light. So be it. Um, that's all I want to do. Uh, well, I thank, think thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shad, again. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, you're recognized for five minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have started off many of the questioning that I have done uh, acknowledging the tragedy of the loss of life and have made that known to many of the witnesses that have come forward. Mr. Doyle, I'd like to acknowledge that to you. And as I um, try to get an understanding of how we can ensure the real facts and that this does not uh, happen again on all parts, I do want to understand something that I read in the New York Times article, but as well, uh, David Koresh's theology suggests that he would come back in 42 months, I believe, from April 1993. And I think, Mr. Doyle, you said uh, that you hope he comes back pretty soon. What do you mean by that? Uh, and when would well, pretty soon be? Well, within my lifetime, surely. <laughs> It, Even a lot sooner than that, but we, we don't set any times, and I don't believe David ever exactly said it that way, that he would be back in 42 months. Did he say it that way, are you saying? I said I don't, I don't recall ever hearing him put a time on it. Uh, what would he say to you when he sees you? I hope he uh, indicates that he's pleased to see me. Uh, I don't know what he'll say. What would he say about your escape? coming out of the building. You go through a lot of guilt when you come out of a situation like this and so many others don't. I feel somewhat guilty that I'm alive. I feel somewhat guilty that I'm out of jail. Uh, I don't think he would condemn me for it, uh, if that's what you're thinking. But I don't really know what he'll say until that day happens. And is he, or would he come back as a human or as God, or however you would interpret it, it would what be better in your a interpretation. Body. Pardon? What we would call a glorified body, visible, uh, but not bound by the flesh. And so you, right now, are not sure when that might be? No. Would he ask you um, about how you escaped? I'd, would he ask oh, you about how you escaped? Me? Pardon? I expect him to already know. You mentioned um, that you were in the chapel, weren't feeling well all day. Is that my understanding, or most of the I day? I had been sick the day before, uh, the 18th. I had been in bed sick all that day. And because I guess I'd dozed off and, and so on, I wasn't able to sleep that following night. So I had come down to the chapel. I was in the chapel at 6 AM when the gassing first started. Were you in the chapel most of the day? Throughout the uh, gas. Of the 19th. Yes. Of the 19th. Up until the uh, wood of the fire, yes. You had indicated several comments about what happened throughout the compound. Was that based on, upon what people told you coming back and forth? I made uh, one trip up to my room in order to get some water. I had some water in a, a glass container, and when we were told that the gas would affect our clothes, our food, our water and so on, I thought to myself, well, it's not going to go through glass, probably. So I went and retrieved water. At that time, I noticed that my room was in the process of being demolished then. That was fairly early in the day. But you, you told us about incidences so, that happened around the compound. Was that based a lot on people coming and telling you since you were in one area? Uh, depends on which instances you're talking about. You mentioned the cafeteria and other locations. I was not aware. Oh, as far as the uh, round hitting Jimmy Riddle in the face, I was told that by somebody. That Let me ask you quickly, and I, I apologize to you. I have some questions for the gentleman dealing with the fire itself. Uh, why were you not allowed to go to certain rooms in the compound? Some rooms were off limits because they were private. David's private rooms were basically off limits unless you're invited. Um, the machine would that shop. be where he would take his wives in some of the rooms? That's where he sl uh, slept up until he moved. Uh, he was not in those rooms on the day of the raid. But he would take some of his wives in those rooms? He would take people in there. He'd take men in there if he wanted to give them a Bible study, or he'd take the women in there if, if that's what was going on. And if he was sleeping, in, that's where he would take his wives in those private areas? Into his rooms, yes. 
Let me ask, um, and Mr. Chairman, I'd ask the same uh, deference. I need the tape run because I have to ask Mr. Quinteri a question about the escape. I have always uh, wanted to pursue the availability, and thank you, Mr. Doyle, of the, of the opportunity for escape. And you mentioned there was the tape where you would show us of the person jumping off the building. I would like you to get me to that point, please, so that I could see that, and I'm going to be talking the questions to both you and Mr. Gray um, of uh, this whole issue of escape. Um, one, uh, the question is, as in terms of the timing, the last questioner had us go through a series of films that started at 1131 with the CEVs. And so my question is, it seems that the first CEV came about that time, or maybe they were there beforehand, but the question is, the fire started how much beyond uh, the CEV? And I, I'm, I don't want to disturb you. I need you to get to the film so I don't lose my time on uh, that question, but how much more time after that CEV that we saw at 1131 did the fire start? And is that likely that you could hit something at 1131 and you be the cause or that entity be the cause of a fire and it didn't show up until about 12 when and if it began to show up? Not likely. As I said, there could be a spill of fuel, but it would have to be ignited later in some fashion. That's the only possibility. So that 20 minutes, except for the lighting of, certainly would have been rare for the CEV to be the only reason that 20 minutes later a fire started. Not from this, the, the flame would not have come from the CEV. Hitting the building, yeah. that's what I'm trying right. to determine. That's right. Are you going to get to that for me? Because then I, that's yeah. what you, I need you and Mr. Gray to answer. That's the, you where want, you showed you, me. Where the person jumps off the roof. That's yes. what you would like to see. Yes, not the one running on the ground, but the right. one jumping off Let's the roof. Let's go to uh, 1218. On and I'd like page. Mr. Gray and Mr. Uh, Contrary to answer the question about the possibility of escape yeah. uh, as you watch this person and how long a period of time um, that uh, was so to reflect upon whether 80 people, 50 people, 30 people could have uh, secured an opportunity for escape. As you showed some flashes, flashovers, and I need to see the context of that so I can... Uh, you have to go back. That's the person jumping. Let's go back. Because I missed it. I was looking at you. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh... All right. Let's stop at that point. Here you see the person on the yeah. roof. That person had previously come out of one of these windows. Uh, that person lay on the roof for some time and has now made a decision to jump off. And we uh, have not identified who that might have been. Yes. That was uh, Abram that, Reynolds. Reynolds. All right. I'm sorry. Ruth Riddle had already come out. Uh, I understand no. Ruth, Ruth Riddle is the person who jumps. If yeah. I was told that. And I'll, I'll show you that, uh, you know, just after this, if we let All this right. run. Let's let this run. So this individual is walking away. Mm -hmm. And then at 12, 19, and 15 seconds, approximately. Is this the time? I'm sorry. You said it was Approximately 12 minutes after the start of the first fire. 12, 19. Yeah, 12, 19. We will see someone jump out of this window. That's a second floor window. Fire conditions would have been much more severe there than on the first floor. And certainly people in the vicinity of this opening could have walked out if they were in that vicinity at about the same time or even later. Would it have been likely Here, then here she is, or if that's what? Miss Riddle, she, there's a person jumping, hanging from that window uh, and okay. falling. All right, and, and therefore, that area there, from your fire experience, evidence is that it was clear enough for someone to get to a window or that it was clear enough that if individuals were in that area, they could have come yes. out. I believe people that were in this area would have had longer time to survive. And certainly people near these openings on the first floor where wind would be blowing through and providing fresh air, they would have had more time to get out. People in the dining room, if there were people there, uh, or people who stayed in the bunker, which ignited later, uh, they would have had to get out much sooner. It's a great in your experience with hands-on fire uh, suppression and saving people. What period of time is a range of time that people could save themselves with a fire raging? From the inception of this fire, and we're talking about this fire only. 
not in general, but we're being specific here. We feel like, because obviously we're uh, you know, 10, 12 minutes, 14 minutes after the fire begins, I would um, take a, a, an educated guess of about 20 to 22 minutes uh, from the inception of this fire, from, uh, from the first ignition, um, that there may have been some viable conditions inside the building. You say people in a 20, 22 period, time period, or people can 20 save minutes themselves. thereabouts. Uh, I think they had, they had 20 minutes or so to get out of the building before they were overcome. The point has been made, and your time is up, but I would, on your time, if you'd let, I'd like Mr. Quintieri maybe to explain where in all of this sequence Mr. Doyle came out, if Mr. Doyle could tell us that. I mean, as long as we've got this picture up here, I think people would like to know that. I, I, I certainly don't know will yield the right. time that I have to you, Mr. Chairman. Just for that purpose. Can you... Uh, do you know, Mr. Doyle, do you, where did you come out of the building? Do you know? You can't see where uh, four of us came out. We came out on the, around the corner on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, uh, out of the chapel, the very back part of but the You chapel. can't see it in, these, in this Not series? Not from this angle. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point in time, I, 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 I might just add that um, the three that came out ahead of me met Renis Abraham when he walked away from the front there, they met at the corner, and they all were out before I came out. Uh, you, you came out after these that we saw jumping? There were three went out ahead of me, unbeknown to me at the time, but when I came out and ran into the razor wire fence, I looked up, and they were already walking up to the gate. So they'd met at the corner. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Barr, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Doyle, uh, previously we've heard testimony from uh, the FBI, that during the course of this whole day, that is April 19th, uh, while the tanks were coming back and forth and the, C, the CS gas being inserted, that they were broadcasting a message over a loudspeaker. Did you hear that message? Part of the time, yes. Uh, was that the message? Do you recall the, uh, some of the words being, this is not an assault? Not assault. We're not entering the building. Okay. Was that being played at the same time as... The pictures that Mr. Shattuck showed us earlier of tanks going in and smashing down walls and going right. up on the roofs. Well, it, uh, it probably started before the actual penetration. But, but, it, but it continued during that time. As far as I know, yes. Uh, in other words, while the tanks were, were, were smashing into the building, they were saying, we're not going to enter the building. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Doyle, there has also been a great, uh, not a great deal of testimony, but some testimony, and I know you're aware of it from, uh, from your experiences as well as the previous trial, about uh, uh, the, uh, the bugging device picking up uh, discussions about uh, fuel being placed around and putting fuel out and saving fuel and so forth the morning of the 19th. Very briefly, what were those conversations concerning, if you know? I never heard the remarks about pouring fuel or uh, spreading fuel. Okay. I did hear one remark in the vicinity of the foyer area or, you know, the front part of the church, uh, because of the cans of fuel that were in the hallway when the tank began to come in the front door, somebody made a remark, we better get the fuel. And several of us ran over and either grabbed one or two cans, one in each hand or whatever, and moved it to what we thought was a safe location. I took mine uh, back to the back stairway and just put them on the bottom of the stairs. Okay. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to the uh, large blow-up of a photograph on the easel here. Uh, and uh, Mr. Bush will point out a, a tank entering the front of the building. Uh, is that, uh, is that uh, the front of the building where that tank, tank is entering? That is the front of the building, but it's not the front door area. That's right. The, that's uh, the one would, that if, if that tank kept going, would it, uh, would it go directly to the bunker area? What they call the bunker, yes. Okay. Do you know if the tank uh, came, came in close proximity with the bunker? Dur during uh, our trial, the driver of the CEV said that he went right on into the kitchen area, which was right in front of the, the tower there. And right. his comment was he never saw so many cans of beans and stuff in his life or something to that effect. Okay. Whether he hit the concrete, I don't know. Okay. Do you know if there was any CS gas in, in the bunker? From what I understand, his purpose for going in was that he sprayed at least one canister or one bottle of gas from the boom in there. It would be almost point blank range. Okay. We had earlier here, but uh, I think some of the, the witnesses earlier took them with them, a, a blow up of this 
uh, schematic diagram here, uh, which uh, shows the location of, uh, of the bodies. And there's a great concentration of bodies that were found in the bunker. That's where the women and children were. What was, their, what was the reason for them going to the bunker area? Well, I can only speculate. I don't know. Uh, but I would say that they probably felt it was safer, that it would maybe protect them from the gas. Was the bunker area one of, one of the lowest uh, rooms in the, in the building? It was on the first floor. Okay. Mr. Uh, Quinteri, uh, if someone, during, dur during the time when the, when the airplane was flying around taking the infrared uh, uh, pictures, if somebody were, were in one of the rooms uh, in the top floor, below the roof, uh, and they struck a match, would that show up on the, uh, on the flare film? No. Okay. If a weapon were discharged uh, inside of a room, uh, would that be picked up? Possibly if the projectile is hot. Okay. Uh, but uh, the striking of a match, the lighting of a Coleman lantern would not have been yeah. picked up. That's okay. Right. Uh, you mentioned earlier, going back to, uh, I think, Mr. Shattuck's line of questioning, or at least he discussed this, the uh, hot spot that, that may have been a reflection. Uh, could that have been something other than a reflection as well? I mean, yes. We don't know what it was, do yes. we? We don't know what it was, but it was momentary and, and did not persist. It, and it didn't recur? Did not, did not okay. recur. Uh, let me ask you, and uh, I know that I'm not asking for, for you to speculate as to whether or not uh, some, something was, was likely or not, but just possible. We went into this with some of the previous witnesses, and if you've already covered this, I apologize for going over it again. But could the... Uh, the CS gas and the, and the methylene uh, chloride vapor uh, have uh, possibly operated as an accelerant? Uh, the answer to that is no. Okay, it could not have? No. It, it, is, it is possible that the, that the methylene chloride, because it's flammable in the vapor state between about 12 and 20 percent, it could, it could ignite and propagate. Nothing like that behavior was seen in this fire. So we can rule that out definitively. Okay, thank you. Time has expired. Uh, Ms. Lofgren, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Mr. Gray, when you uh, made your comment about how you felt when you saw uh, the fire for the first time, I felt it just brought back memories for me because I felt exactly the way, just sick and close to tears just thinking about what was happening and I think I was glad you said that because I think it reminded a lot of us how we felt and the question is you know how did it happen did it have to happen and I think to some extent at least I hope that that this uh, hearing will at least help in some way to to determine that you know I um, listening to you Mr. Doyle I was uh, and I've been saying throughout uh, these hearings. I think it's important whether I share your faith or not that people should have tried to understand the, the world from the point of view of yourself and others whose beliefs differ from my own. Um, and I'm not sure that happened. Perhaps it was impossible uh, for that to happen. But one of the things I'm wondering about is your relationship uh, or I don't know if it's probably not the right word but uh, between Mr. Koresh, who was your leader, and uh, yourself and the, and the other Davidians. For 51 days, between the February ATF raid and April 19th, there were all kinds of discussions going on between Mr. Koresh and I think Mr. Schneider, as well as the negotiators. Did he talk to you about what the content of those negotiations and what was said? Steve Schneider would, uh, at times, tell us what was being discussed on the phones, but not minute by minute rundown. Mm -hmm. And what about David Koresh? As I said, David was basically incapacitated for the first several weeks anyway of the, of the siege. And uh, he After did, that? 
I only probably saw him two or three times in the whole 51 so, days. So he didn't, the, the, the FBI at, at certain points the negotiators were urging uh, people to leave and urging him to have people leave. That was never, he never like had a meeting and told people the Davidians that, that necessarily. No, Steve Schneider went around uh, day by day and would ask, well, who wants to go out today? That was uh, a daily routine as far as uh, on Steve's part. But it wasn't like they said you should leave now, and he didn't play that role. Uh, Mr. Korsh, I mean. No, he didn't come down and, and make a point. You know, we had asked, and actually I think Mr. Taylor asked, and I thought it was a good idea, but I guess we're not going to do it, to, enter, uh, to subpoena some of the reporters who've written stories, and I think all of us in public life know that just because it's printed in the newspaper doesn't mean it's true. That's what we've come to learn. Um, so I, since you're under oath, I'd like to ask you a question about it. There was an art, a series of articles printed in the Waco Tribune Herald, and in that one of part three of that uh, series, there is a story, uh, I'll summarize it, there was a Barbara Slauson and yourself were going for a, um, a, a shopping trip of some sort, and that the car stopped and that you believe that Koresh had the power to stop that vehicle. Is that, an act, is that true or not true? That I'm story? not even familiar with that story at all. I don't That's recall it. Karen Doyle. Oh, Karen I'm is sorry. my oldest daughter. Your oldest daughter. Would you believe as part of your faith that Mr. Koresh would have, have had the ability to do such a thing? To stop? To stop the vehicle. So, mm -hmm. uh, David made a point of always saying, I do not have the ability to do miracles. My only gift, we might say, is uh, to explain the scriptures as God showed them to him. Okay. He, he made no profession of doing miracles or tricks or anything. All right. Let me, let me ask you that you're, there's an article in the New York Times as well that uh, indicates, I guess you were interviewed and, uh, and another uh, lady who uh, also, uh, a Davidian who did not perish, uh, quoting or paraphrasing that uh, Koresh was um, a prophet, and that what happened was outlined in the book of Revelations. Do you believe that's true? If you could just say yes or no, because I'm about to run out of time. Okay. Uh, we accepted, originally we accepted David as a prophet. We come to accept him as somewhat more than that toward the end. Okay. Um, I don't want to interrupt, but I've got about 30 seconds okay. left, and I've got one more question. We saw connections with what happened. Uh, to what we were being taught, but they are not the complete fulfillment. No. So, so what happened really was not complete, but pretty close to what was expected was during, a, in uh, the book a sample, of Revelation. You might say, or... I see. Let me ask Mr. Gray, and um, Mr. Doyle referenced it earlier uh, in his uh, testimony that he was, and I can't remember what the exact uh, phrase is, uh, an arson dog had hit on him for his clothes and shoes. I'm not an arson investigator. He'd also indicated today in his testimony that he didn't see anybody tip over uh, lanterns or in, in that he certainly uh, you know, just didn't see anything like that. Why would a dog, first of all, did a dog do that? Uh, why would that be? What could the explanation for that be in your professional judgment, sir? The answer to your question is we, we did bring in a specially trained hydrocarbon accelerant detecting canine in. This is similar to a drug dog or bomb dog. They're trained to sniff out and alert when they smell hydrocarbon related products. Um, the dog hit on about a hundred different places in the compound. We basically gridded the, the ground out and had the dog trace over most of it and the dog hit made positive alert signs in uh, about a hundred places. Um, and they corresponded with the points of origin that we established. The uh, dining room area, the chapel, and that left, uh, excuse me, right front window. One of the other things we had the dog do is sniff, if you will, the clothing that had been removed from the Davidians as they left the building, including Mr. Doyle's clothing. I think he testified earlier that um, he stepped in some kerosene or something outside on his, on his uh, shoes. Well, the problem with that is when the dog alerts on something, and I also have to say this, I have to qualify it, a dog's sensitivity is about a thousand times more sensitive than a gas chromatograph. 
Um, the, what I mean by that is a dog may alert on something and it comes back negative from the lab, laboratory that is. In this case, the dog did alert on Mr. Doyle's shoes. They were submitted to a laboratory and the laboratory analysis showed that that was a light naphtha consistent with Coleman fuel, just like the can in the picture we had earlier. Coleman fuel, which was also found in the uh, inside the chapel area where Mr. Doyle was and, and where he escaped from. His jacket, very interestingly, was also alerted on by the dog. We removed the jacket, laid the jacket out on the ground with both sleeves spread out, and actually walked around the jacket with the dog. The dog only alerted on the cuffs of the sleeves. Mr. Doyle's hands are not burnt the way you would think of a, a thermal burn. His hands were on fire. The sleeves of that jacket were also analyzed. And the laboratory report determined that they did contain a class zero deparaffinated kerosene consistent with, in fact, I remember this phone call because I had no idea what these items were. They were all numbers to me. Dr. Armstrong called me and told me, I have an identifier uh, on, you know, number 19C or whatever it was. He says, it's charcoal starter fluid. And I congratulated him. Very good, Doc. You did a great job. And he says, you want to know what kind? And I said, yes. He says, it's Gulf Light. Now, what I find <clears throat> painful, actually, I f first of all, I find it painful to say right here in front of Mr. Doyle. And I find it horrifying to think that this is what really happened. But Mr. Doyle has testified that he rolled around on the floor and he had his back was on fire and all this kind of stuff and he stepped in some fuel outside. Um, that may very well be the case, except the fuel that was on his sleeves was different than the fuel that was on his shoes. The fuel on his sleeves was the same kind of fuel you use to start a charcoal fire, Gulf Light, charcoal starter fluid that was analyzed by the lab. His hands are not burnt. They were burning. They were on fire. Big difference. Mr. Taylor, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Doyle, like everyone else, I regret the loss of the life of your daughter. And I, I really think that uh, all of this was preventable. But I personally think it was preventable if David Quest, who had, apparently from everything I can see and read and hear, an incredible amount of control over people. Husbands gave their wives to him. Parents gave their very small children him. Uh, your local paper said that, uh, and I'm quoting, now Howell was turning the Branch Davidians into a harem. The men were virtual, virtual eunuchs sworn to guard his secret. Most married men stayed after Howell took their wives. To those who left the cult into outsiders, they were saps, but they couldn't bear the thought of leaving. It threw them into despair, for if they left, what was all the suffering for. In these articles, it says that Howell says that he was the Lamb of God. It actually quotes him talking to a reporter saying, and I'm, uh, that he was Jesus. Do you believe the David Gresh? He never claimed to be Jesus. Well, well sir, may I, may I quote? Uh, I, I'm going to quote. But I in another interview, Howell confirmed the... making this astonishing claim, if the Bible is true, I'm Christ. But so what? What's so great about being Christ? A man <clears throat> nailed to the cross. A man acquitted with, acquainted with grief. You know, being Christ ain't nothing. The name Jesus and the name Christ are separate with us. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, do you think David Koresh said that and do you believe it to be true? What I'm saying is he never taught he was Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. We do believe he was a Messiah, yes. And you believe that he was a Messiah? A Messiah. Okay. In an article, and I'm not, I think this came out of the New York Times, 
there's a curious quote attributed to you and another person. And it says, if God gives us a command, then it's not a sin. Would that include anything? Adultery, lying, stealing, murder? In the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not kill. For those who believe the Bible, that's God's instructions to Israel at Sinai. A number of months or years later, they come up to Canaan, and they're told to go in and kill all the people that live there. You be the judge. Did you make that statement that if God gives us a command, then it's not a sin? We believe that if a command comes from God, then he takes the responsibility for it. It is not sin if you're obedient to what God says. Did God command the Davidians to kill those four ATF agents? God didn't command me to kill anybody. There was no orders to kill anybody. Uh, in fact, I don't believe it was ever proven in our trial that we actually killed them. It's, I'm not saying nobody shot anybody from within, but it was never proven as to who shot who. And a lot of, uh, there was some evidence that there was friendly fire in the wounding or whatever of some of the agents. I'm not denying that they might have been shot by us, but it wasn't proven. In self-defense, I believe that the people were justified if they fired back when uh, heavy amounts of uh, gunfire were fired into rooms with women and children. Mr. Gray, I'd like to go to your testimony because I've done a lot of research on this, and I'd like you to go back to your theory of how the fire started. I heard you talk about the gasoline cans being open. Please, in the, in the brief amount of time that remains, tell us how you think the fire started. Well, <clears throat> I thought we had done that, but basically, Dr. Quinteri and I were part of the same team. His report is actually a supplement to mine. Uh, there, are, there is no disagreement between us that this fire was intentionally started inside the compound by the people in there using flammable liquids as accelerants. When you say the people in there, who is that? The Davidians themselves. In fact, um, uh, <laughs> if, if you don't mind me jumping back to my statement again, there's one, I, I one like sentence. It. I think it's worth um, saying. And, and I, I, I wanted to say this too because of my, uh, I don't know, because of what they accused me of being in collaboration with the government. Um, federal law enforcement officers obviously did make some tactical errors prior to and during this tragic incident. And I hope this body, somebody, holds them accountable. Please, I'm pleading with you, somebody out there in the federal government still screwed up big time, okay? But they didn't start this fire. That's the bottom line. There is no doubt in my mind that the ultimate responsibility for intentionally setting fire to the Branch Davidian compound lies squarely and solely with the Davidians themselves. And there's just, that's all I got to say about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Zeloff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doyle, uh, did you notice while you were in the compound uh, anything relative to a uh, methamphetamine lab, anything was, relative to drugs, any, anything, any, any meth labs at all? There was no lab in Mount Carmel under David's jurisdiction. We found upon returning there after being gone for a few years, uh, in 1988, we found evidence that somebody, uh, not a member of the church, had had a drug lab. And that uh, paraphernalia, recipes, chemicals, whatever was handed over to the sheriff's department. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you've, you've gone through an awful experience. And uh, as we sat and listened to you today, um, and you've been through a trial and you've gone through two years where you've had a chance to think about it this week, kind of opens that all up again. You've heard testimony, the ATF, FBI, and, and all of us. And uh, what do you think? I mean, what, what's come out of this? Have we gotten, are we making any progress? Uh, there's still a lot of conflicting information. If you... One thing I do want to stress, and that is that suicide was definitely against the doctrines. Well, that's one question I had. Was there any evidence of suicide? From my point of view, no. 
Uh, I don't believe in suicide. It was not taught by David or any of the other. No leaders. suicide pact. No no meetings talking no. about. No. Nothing. Um, as far as the fire starting and how it started, I am not going to speculate. It certainly didn't start in the area that I was in. I saw no one else lighting it in the chapel or, or anywhere. So. So the voices that at, at 6 a.m. that were heard saying spreading the fuel, spread the fuel around, uh, the comments about hay, you, you don't, nothing you saw would indicate any I never heard those statements, no. You never heard those statements? No. I will admit there was hay in, in parts of the building. Uh, right. If Which, you'd like me to explain that. Sure. Um, as a result of the initial raid, the front of the building was so shot up, especially the women and children's quarters, that we, uh, some of the men took boxes of potatoes out of the uh, kitchen area and put them all around the windows to kind of block up the holes from the weather. Uh, over the 51 days of the siege, uh, the potatoes sprouted and eventually went rotten because we couldn't cook without electricity uh, and so on. Uh, so they were removed. And I think in some of the women's rooms, there were some bales of hay put around the windows to take the place of the but, potatoes. But no, no passing hay on top of a fire to no, create? No, I, I never. Did, did, what about children and, and your process? You said you got out of the building with four people. On the way out, did you see um, any children at all? Did you no, see they were women? at the other end of the building. In the, the other end. end. Or in what, the center of the building. Actually. If you can, uh, and, and let me just ask Mr. Sherrill and, and Mr. Poitier and Mr. Gray, is there a four and a half minute gap on the uh, freer tape? between 11.30 and 4 and 12 o'clock? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Uh, I didn't focus on that part of the tape. The tape that I looked at was mainly Could over Could you the, check and, and get back to us to see if there is? I'm not even sure if I have that okay. part of the tape. OK. Um, I, I guess, uh, if I may sir, yes, the copy of the tape I have does have a gap in it. It does have, and it's four and a half minutes? Approximately, yeah. yes, sir. Just, uh, you, you've heard, we've heard some conflicting testimony on the fire, and, and you have some strong feelings. Just, if you can, in, in, in less than a minute, tell us in, in a summary where you disagree the most. Uh, the main thing is, uh, I don't discount that it, the fire was started uh, inside by the, by the uh, people inside. It could well have been. What I do have a serious problem with is the government's refusal to provide material under the, the rules of disclosure and the complete destruction of the fire scene uh, without letting independent investigators examine it. Well, all right. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Doyle, and I'll let Mr. Doyle answer after you've had a chance to answer. Um, and and you've, saw, you've, you've seen this thing. This is two years ago. We've gone through a criminal trial. We're in a civil trial. Uh, you've seen all this week, you've seen all the comments about the fact that nothing new is coming out of here. Uh, what we're trying to do is all anti-law enforcement and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're committed, and I'll stand on the record, that we're committed to getting at the truth, and we make no apologies for getting at the truth. Just uh, both of you, just any, you've watched now eight, nine days of this. Uh, you've heard a FBI, you've heard ATF, you've heard Mr. Potts. Uh, you, you've heard the two guys that got fired and rehired. Um, just your reactions, each of you, in terms of what you heard this week, whether any new information got out, what information we need to still get out. If you think somebody ought to be held accountable, who do you think that should be? What are we missing? What have we got out at this point? First you, Mr. Sherrill. Uh, yes, sir, I do believe quite a bit of new information has come out. I believe it's been very valuable. There's still a lot more to come. Uh, as I said earlier on, there's some outstanding law enforcement agents that need the tarnish taken off their badges. If it requires criminal prosecution for wrongdoing, if the courts find that, if uh, hearings and investigations find that, that's what we need to do. We've got to get the confidence of the American public back in law enforcement. It's there, but it's been diminishing. We've got to clean that up. These hearings are really going a long way okay, toward and, that. And the one question I did ask, and, and, and I just restated, is there anything that we've missed that we should go after in the remaining two days? Yes, sir. I think we've uh, missed some of the uh, questions as to, as I mentioned earlier, why items of evidence have disappeared, why the crime scene was destroyed before it could be evaluated. Uh, these areas, especially the evidence disappearing. Mr. Doyle, I have a chance of two, two people, so you're my second one. 
I have to admit that I have not followed these hearings uh, in every detail. We can't get C-SPAN where I'm from, but at least we don't have it. Um, I think that a lot of things have been brought out from what I'm hearing and seeing uh, that weren't brought out before. I'm glad that for once, uh, uh, the President made a statement a while back that we've already had a bunch of hearings already and uh, he saw no need for this one. Uh, I don't believe that there was ever any witnesses, uh, uh, excuse me, survivors that were witnesses in those hearings. Uh, so I'm happy for that reason. I do feel that uh, the issues that uh, Mr. Shero mentioned need to be addressed for the sake of this country. Uh, and I would especially like, which may be beyond this committee, I don't know, but I would like the situation of the nine that are in prison to be reviewed as to why they're doing 40 years when a jury found them innocent of the major crimes. Were you guilty of any crime? No, I was not. Thank you very much, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Thurman, you're recognized for five minutes. of my colleagues <laughs> on the loss of your daughter and certainly your friends. Do you remember at any time at the very beginning um, when the FBI actually took over the compound or actually became involved in this? And evidently Mr. Koresh at that time had said that he wanted to talk to a Dr. Philip Arnold. Right. Okay. Um, Doctor, I don't know if you know this, but Dr. Arnold actually had an opportunity to speak before this, this committee a I couple of... It. I haven't seen any reports or, you okay. know. Well, he did, and, and he was very good at trying to explain um, your beliefs. And I just want to kind of go over something with you to, to okay. maybe help clear up this issue on the fire a little bit. And, and I'm going to read actually from a statement that he made okay. um, so that you'll understand that it is from him. It should be understood when discussing the fire and its origins that if the evidence shows that the Branch Davidian ringleader started the fires, this does not prov prove suicide was the reason. The FBI did not believe that suicide was an option for the Branch Davidians. Also, the bug tapes recorded Davidian telling his fellows not to spread all the fuel now, but to save some for later. This indicates that the purpose for spreading fuel was not suicide, because there would be no later. It suggests a motive more in line with their religious beliefs against mass suicide and compatible with their belief that God would protect his people from harm. This motive is consistent with another remark on the tapes, which seems to say, so we don't light it up till they come in. If the Branch Davidian started a fire, it would be done to provide a defense against a penetrating assault by the tanks and troop support. They seem to have regarded it as a last resort to be used only if the tanks come in. As a last resort, they would light up the firewall to halt the tanks from advancing on their women and children hiding in the walk in the middle of their sacred center. Their religious faith in God would have trust him to protect them from the fire getting out of control. But when it did get out of control, some were overcome by smoke, others were burned, and so on. He has suggested that is from Zechariah chapter 2. Could you tell me about this particular belief in your own words? There are references to God being a ring of fire around Jerusalem. Uh, it's in reference to God being their protection. It is not. It has nothing to do with human beings lighting fires, uh, and I never heard David make that analogy or, or comparison. Um, always, our trust has been in God, even if He allows us to die. There were times in the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament, where people went through fire or went through uh, being in a lion's den or. or under siege and so when God did miraculous deliverances. But we also have the early Christian church of the first century who believed in that same God and were allowed to be eaten by the lions and, and so on. So we were prepared, you might say, whatever God allowed to happen to us to accept it as his will, we didn't lose faith in God or the people that we felt that uh, he had used, such as David and, 
uh, and others in the past. Uh, but we certainly didn't believe in suicide because I... And, and it suggests that, they, that you did not believe in suicide. Right. Never in here does it mention this, but it does mention the idea of a ring of fire. Suicide to me is an, an unpardonable sin because you can't ask forgiveness for it once you're dead, you know. But the ring of fire was meant that to was God's protect protection. you. And basically, it is literally what it says in the scripture. God will be a ring of fire around Jerusalem, the literal right. city of Jerusalem, not Mount Carmel or whatever. Mr. Doyle, there also, evidently during your testimony with the FBI, there was a question about the fire. Um, do you remember giving, um, I guess with your attorney present, any statement um, to them about the fire at that time? To the FBI? Mm -hmm. Or Texas Rangers, I'm sorry. The Texas Rangers came to me while I was up at Parkland Hospital in the burn ward. Uh, I think the initial contact was through one of the hospital personnel asking would I give them uh, an interview and I said I did not feel up to it. Uh, they eventually made their way to my room and, and basically even though I said I wouldn't give them an interview they said well can we read the questions to you to which to my recollection I remember saying no comment no comment all the way through I, I did not answer their questions. Uh, since then I've heard that I've been quoted as saying certain things but I would deny them. Who are the Babylons in your mind? Everybody. All mankind. We're all in Babylon. That's basically confusion. It starts in your head and it affects families and it affects countries and, and this whole planet. Thank you very much and thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Irvin. I believe that uh, everybody has had their time except the chairman. I'll yield five minutes to myself. Uh, Mr. Doyle, I, I, you've had a long day, but I do have a couple of other questions and then we'll wrap up. I just want to clarify something. Did you light or start any fires on April 19, 1993? No, I did not. Thank you. Uh, can you explain in any way why you might have had two different fuel part of, uh, on different parts of your clothing or body that Mr. Gray was alluding to a minute ago? I have to admit that I had a cigarette lighter on, in my pocket. And uh, as a result of the initial raid, a lot of people reacted through nervousness or whatever, and uh, I smoked. Not that I am a smoker, I, don't, I haven't smoked since coming out. Uh, many, many years ago I gave up smoking, back in when I was 20. And so, uh, but I smoked, because we were, I was very nervous. I smoked and I ate. And you <laughs> on, think that some of that uh, fuel from the cigarette lighter somehow was uh, in your clothing? There was an issue made of that during the Did trial that a, a lighter was found in my pocket. I, I'd say that it probably could have got on the what, of my what, what about uh, any lighting of kerosene lamps or other kinds of, I don't know what kind of fuel you had in there for those lamps in the morning. Did you do that? Um, I can remember women bringing their lanterns to be refilled in the chapel from time to time, but I don't you recall ever lighting them for you did, them. Did you refill, refill them that morning? Not that I recall on April 19th. Right. In fact, the only woman that ever came into the chapel, to my knowledge, on April 19th was Jennifer Andrade, who came down fairly early in the morning asking were there any gas masks because the women in her area did not have any. And uh, I indicated that there was a, a black plastic garbage sack there in the pews uh, with some gas masks in. Have I said, go ahead and have, take them. Have you heard anybody who was there either during the course of your stay in the compound uh, before and between the 28th of February and the 19th of April or since? Uh, who survived with you say that they uh, believed or that they saw uh, anyone uh, making or lighting uh, any fire that day at all on the 19th of April 1993? I, I don't recall any of the survivors or especially the guys that I was in jail with uh, saying they saw How anybody. How about any plans? Anybody say or discuss any plans to light any fires? There's no before plans discussed with me uh, to light fires or anything. No. no, no discussion by anybody saying they might do something like that to, to protect themselves, to barricade the kids, to return, to return uh, something, or throw Molotov cocktails. There, there may like have that. been some discussion early in the siege when the tanks were first brought in. Well, how do you cope with a tank? You know, and there may have been statements like, "Well, you can't shoot it with a rifle or a pistol," uh, and references may have been made to 
Molotov well, cocktails. None that used day, to, or none within the close proximity. But not, of the a, not to my knowledge. What about on sanitation? April what about sanitation? In there? We've heard a lot about it being very, very bad uh, the last week or two. Uh, was this unhealthy? It, for it kids was no, for you? no worse on the last day than it was throughout the 51 days. What it was my job basically to dig the holes that we we had outhouses at Mount Carmel due to the fact that we were in the process of building and indoor plumbing wasn't uh, a big thing at the time and. Uh, once the, we came under attack and siege, we were not able to get to the outhouses and the, actually the tanks bulldozed them over anyway. So uh, we, we were using a bucket system uh, on the various levels. Uh, we had little areas marked off for toilets and every day these would be taken and uh, emptied. I would dig a hole and empty and fill it up. And was, was, was this unsanitary, in your opinion, for the kids? Or the, was, uh, it, was the disease potentially there that was greater than it was? It was not a great situation, season? but I don't think it was potentially, I should say, it was taken care of every day. It was, it was not getting worse. It was not imminent that somebody was, was going was to get not, very ill because of this. If there was, any, there was any uh, human waste found or spread over the building, I would say it was because tanks maybe went through the area on that day, but uh, as far as on a day-to-day -day basis, they were taken care of and disposed of. Uh, I would like to know what the attitude of the people in the compound was, your friends, the people who you associated with in the last uh, five, six days before the 19th. Were they upbeat? Uh, were they down? Uh, were they, was it any change from the week before? Uh, was there any sense of hope uh, greater or less than there had been uh, in any previous time, and if so or if not, why? I, th I think there was a, a kind of an upbeat, uh, having heard that um, God had indicated to David that he was to write out the seals, and we were told the negotiators had given him the green light that whatever time he needed, uh, he could spend writing them and so on. I think I think we were looking forward to, to that it was going to be over. Uh, did you have any sense? Of, other, did huh? you have any sense of how long this might take, or any sense of um, when you might come out, or if you would come out? There was the possibility it might take him a week or two to. to to get them all written. I, I don't know Would whether you? he discussed that with the negotiator, but I was told that they said whatever time it, he needed would be granted. Did you believe that uh, he was going to do that? Did yes, you believe yes, that you were going to come out? Yes, I did. And uh, would you have ever come out had uh, David Koresh not said it was all right to come out? And uh, If he'd indicated that, um, you know, God wanted us to just submit to, to the authorities or whatever, we were willing to do that. Uh, well, we were well, but if he didn't to indicate to that to you, would you, would you have ever come out of, outside well, of this fire against his, will, against his will? He didn't tell me to escape from the fire. I came out. I, I think that over a period of time we were all planning to come out. Let me ask one last question. I know I've passed my time, but I've got to get this out. You're the only Davidian I know to ask this to here today or in the hearings. And, and, and that is, do you have an opinion? based on all your knowledge of, of your beliefs and the attitudes and, and, and beliefs of those who were inside living at Mount Carmel before the February 28th raid of the ATF, had David Koresh been arrested outside the compound? Had he been, had arrested? He been arrested? No, if he had been arrested, oh. if, he had been arrested, if, he had been arrested if he had been arrested outside the compound, if he'd been taken away from you, if you will, uh, and then somebody come knocked on the door to do a search warrant, would, the, would there have been anything different? Would you have... How would you have reacted to that? We'd probably, especially if they'd have come knocking, whether he was there or not, I think they would have been admitted in. Uh, if they'd have come, you know, regularly and just knocked on the door and said, we need to see your guns or whatever. Uh, David Koresh had been arrested along with some friends, uh, you know, some of the church members back in 87. And uh, nobody reacted violently or made threats of revenge or anything like that. So you, didn't, we you, would, not have anti you would not have anticipated a, a, an excessive reaction, a, a no. negative reaction in such a way as to be violent against anybody? No. And, I, last, and last but not least, were there any plans? Because we've heard uh, somebody say there was a McDonald's, that uh, somebody was going to go out and kill everybody at McDonald's, some witness here said, that came out after the fact. Were there any plans that you know of by anybody in the compound at any time when you were there uh, to go uh, out and, and uh, injure or destroy property or injure people no. in the local community? No. All right. Thank you. Mr. Taylor? Mr. Chairman, since you, you went over... You can ask a question or two if you'd like. Okay. I, 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 want to clarify I just the want to, because I know that someone's going to answer differently than some other people have, but I would like to ask the exact same question to this panel. You know, have you heard anything? Have you seen anything? Have you read anything? 
that in any way justifies the murder of those four ATF agents by David Crest and his followers, Absolutely. and the wounding of 20 more, and or, or absolves David Koresh from the guilt of having those 80 people die with him. Mr. Quintenny? Uh, no, sir. Mr. Chair? No, sir. Mr. Doyle? I don't believe they were murdered. I think they were set at risk by their own agencies going ahead knowing that uh, we in all likelihood knew they were coming. I think that they went against their own laws uh, attacking a building no knowing that there were women and children in there. Uh, if the officers exposed themselves to fire by stepping out and, and emptying their magazines into the building and someone did shoot them, uh, I would consider that self-defense, not murder. Okay, so I don't think anybody is justified in doing murder. Defending yourself is a different proposition. Okay. And we don't call it murder if we go and shoot people in a wartime situation, and it certainly looked like a battle to us. You had one follow-up, and I will permit it. We do appreciate that. But, Mr. Doyle, David Koresh would not have been able to physically to escape because of his wounds. But he, his body was found with a bullet hole through his mouth and the barrel of a gun lying next to him, not the barrel, the, the, yes, the, the barrel, and, uh, which would certainly have indicated that David Koresh and others did indeed commit suicide. What, what is your thought about that? I am not aware that he had a bullet hole in his mouth. I understand well, uh, he had a bullet hole in the head. All right. Now, whether somebody else shot him, I don't know. Apparently, you know, it's possible. Um, I can only tell you what I was told. It's hearsay. Rennes Abraham told me he was sitting in the hall upstairs and uh, at one point in the, in the morning, and he went into the front room, which he ended up exiting from. This is correct. You're talking about. Rennes Abraham went into this room right. that he ended up exiting from, and in the room, he said, was David Koresh, Steve Schneider, and Mark Wendell. He said they were sitting on a bed talking. He says, and he went in and was listening to what they were having to say. He said, and the next thing, the room filled with smoke. He says, and he walked over to the window and trying to get a breath of fresh air. And he said, the thought came to him, why am I standing here sucking air through a broken window? Why don't I just go out? So he went out on the, on the roof. And that was, as I say, the last time that he saw David. Uh, both Steve Schneider and David had bullet wounds. Now, whether somebody shot them to put them out of their misery, whether they ran out into the hall and found they were in the middle of the fire instead of escaping it, I don't know. I don't know what they went through because I wasn't there. Uh, I figure that if somebody did, uh, found themselves trapped and uh, was, were burning and suffering, if they asked for somebody to put them out of the misery, I wouldn't condemn that person, but I don't know that the deed. I never, there was no one in our area that came up with bullet holes, thank the Lord, and uh, so there was no condemnation in that area for us that escaped, but I couldn't speak for the others. Thank you, Mrs. Slaughter. Well, we, we've certainly been a long day today. I want to thank uh, all of you for being here in this panel. I know Mr. Doyle has been particularly tough on you, but we want to thank for the professionals who are here for helping us walk through this fire. It has been one of the great, uh, I guess, discussed parts of the entire Waco affair, and I hope that after this we can assess better, with your help, uh, what happened on that final fateful day. We will be in recess until Monday morning at 10 a.m. We, we will reconvene in uh, room 2141 next door, the Judiciary Committee room. These uh, subcommittees are in recess. This concludes Day 8 of the House Waco hearings. 
Tomorrow, see the ninth day of the hearings. Witnesses are FBI special agents. And on Friday, the tenth and final day of Waco hearings, we'll hear from Attorney General Janet Reno. Each weekday for the rest of this week, we'll re-air the House Waco hearings at 10 a.m. Eastern Time here on C-SPAN. Labor Day weekend on C-SPAN, we mark the 50th anniversary of VJ Day, the end of the war with Japan. Among the events we're covering live, beginning Saturday,